Hello gamers, and welcome to the first half of the surreal game Iceberg. This iceberg is a 400 plus entry iceberg, so uh, yeah, it's it's pretty big, and uh, this is just the first half of it. The games on this iceberg are just really surreal and creepy and spooky and all those sort of things. The iceberg showcases a bunch of weird and surreal games from all around the internet. Some of them you can find on Steam really easily, and some you can only find on dead Japanese files sharing sites. Uh, that's that's about it for an introduction. Um, have fun listening to me talk about surreal games for two and a half hours. Um, it's very interesting stuff. Don't forget to like and subscribe before we start and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, just thank you for watching. First up we have one that most of you probably already know, Yume Nikki. Damn, it, it says a lot about the iceberg when the first entry is Yume Nikki. If you don't already know, Yume Nikki is a Japanese RPG maker game. Uh, yeah, we'll be seeing a lot of these on the list from 2004. What makes this game surreal is that it doesn't really have what you would call traditional gameplay. There's no plot, no dialogue no combat, and no objectives. In the game, you play as Madosuki, which means windowed in Japanese. Throughout the game, you experience what appears to be her dreams. The game gets pretty dark at times, with references to anxiety, violence, and identity. The cryptic nature of these dreams has led the fandom of Yume Nikki to study every aspect of the game and develop their own theories. These theories get very deep and are honestly quite interesting. If you have the time, I recommend playing it, and if not, go look at some theories for the game. It's, uh, it's quite the rabbit hole. Next up we have WarioWare. WarioWare is a banger of a series and is definitely a favourite of mine. While not too obscure or anything, I can definitely see how WarioWare can be seen as surreal. WarioWare, sometimes known as WarioWare Inc., is a series of video games starring Wario and his friends. Unlike the Wario Land games, which are platformers like the main Mario series, WarioWare is a series of minigame compilations. WarioWare is unique, however, in that the minigames are very short, most only lasting several seconds. These micro games make up the basis of the series and are strung together in quick succession with different control schemes, encouraging the frantic action by the player. WarioWare has also been known for incorporating a gimmick in each game, mostly taking advantage of the latest Nintendo hardware. I've only played two WarioWare games, being the one for the Game Boy Advance and the most recent one for the Switch, and I gotta say, they're pretty solid games. Omori. Omori is a famous indie game by the studio Omocat. Promise not to crucify me for this, but I haven't actually played Omori before. From what I've seen online though, it seems to have quite a large fan base. From what I can tell, Omori is a JRPG, inspired by the previously mentioned Yume Nikki and Earthbound. As you'll see on this iceberg, quite a lot of games listed are inspired by Earthbound, which I'll be talking about later in this tier. In Omori, the player controls a hikikomori named Sunny and his dream world alter ego, Omori. They explore both the real world and a surreal dream world to overcome their fears and secrets. How they interact depends on the choices made by the player, resulting in one of several endings. The game's turn-based battle system includes unconventional status effects based on the character's emotions, prominently featuring concepts such as anxiety, depression, and trauma. The game has psychological horror elements. Like Yume Nikki, the thing that makes Omori surreal is the exploration of the player's dreams, Harvester. This game is one of the first games I've ever played. Now that I think about it, the fact that I played this when I was like 10 years old explains quite a lot. Harvestar is a point-and-click adventure game from 1996 where you play as Steve Mason, an 18-year-old boy that wakes up in the town of Harvest in 1953 with no memory of who he is. This game is whack, like seriously whack. Definitely one of the most disturbing games I've played. For example, there's a there's a certain scene involving capital punishment in an elementary school and um there's one scene with with that baby. While disturbing, the game has really good writing, with each character you meet spitting goofy comments at you. The whole idea of the game, or at least what I take from it, is that it's meant to be sort of a self-parody 
making fun of gratuitous violence in video games during the 90s. And oh boy, does this game have gratuitous violence. What makes this game surreal is, well, everything. Not a single character you meet in this game is sane, and the end completely screws with your mind, which I'm not gonna spoil. Just play the game for yourself, it's it's a blast. Desert Bus. Desert Bus, or as I like to call it, the best game ever created, is a game where you drive a bus on a road in a desert. That's... That's it. Despite how boring the gameplay is, the backstory of the game is pretty interesting. So, you know Penn and Teller, right? If you were born after the 2000s, maybe not. Penn and Teller are, I guess what you would call a magician slash comedy duo. They're mostly known for the TV show, in which magicians perform tricks on stage and attempt to fool Penn and Teller. Anyway, in the mid 90s, they planned to release a game for the Sega CD called Penn and Teller's Smoke and Mirrors. The game revolved around these mini games that were designed for for people to fool their friends. While well, the game was unreleased, a copy of it was passed around the internet back in 2005 and gained quite a lot of attention, mostly because of the game Desert Bus. Desert Bus is definitely the most notorious mini game in the collection. The objective of the game is to drive a bus from Tucson, Arizona all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada in real time at a maximum speed of 45 miles. The feat requires 8 hours of continuous gameplay in real time to complete. Um, I tried playing this game, but after 20 minutes of playing I could feel my brain cells dying, so I, I, I decided to put it down. While this game has a unique gimmick, it's just that. A gimmick. Earthbound. Um, it's Earthbound. You probably know what it is. Earthbound is one of, if not, the most known surreal game. Despite its age, Earthbound has inspired the creation of countless games such as Undertale and even the previously mentioned Omori. What makes Earthbound so revolutionary is that it was one of the first RPGs to not take itself so seriously, and the fact that it was the first Japanese RPG that was made with American kids in mind. Earthbound can be best described as quirky, I guess. It plays like a classic JRPG for the SNES, but with a unique combat system. What makes this game so surreal is the plot. Here's a here's a synopsis. Earthbound chronicles the adventure of Ness, a 13-year-old boy who journeys around the world using his PK or Psy to collect eight melodies in order to save the future from an alien of pure evil, intending to sentence all of reality to the horror of eternal darkness. Yeah, definitely definitely a bit surreal. Besides the main plot, what makes the game so good is its side plots. I could talk about the whack stuff that happens in this game for hours, but I'll let my friend, the angry video game nerd, sum it up for you. You never know what this game's gonna throw at you. All of a sudden, you're fighting a bunch of police officers. Police officers are trying to beat up a child. Then you're fighting a bunch of clansmen who worship the color blue. Holy shit, I'm so overwhelmed trying to explain everything that happens here. The question is, what doesn't happen? Undertale. Speaking of Earthbound, next up we have Undertale. You most likely already know what Undertale is. It's one of the most popular games ever made. Undertale is a direct predecessor to Earthbound, created by the mad lad himself, Toby Fox, in 2015. The player meets various monsters during the journey back to the surface, although some monsters might engage the player in a fight. The combat system involves the player navigating through mini bullet hell attacks by the opponent. It can opt to pacify or subdue monsters in order to spare them instead of killing them. The choices affect the game, with dialogue, characters, and the story changing based on the outcomes. Just like Earthbound, the thing that makes Undertale so surreal is the plot along with all the wacky characters you meet throughout the game. The Silent Hill series. The Silent Hill games are classic horror games that still influence the horror genre to this day. As a side note, Silent Hill 2 is one of my favorite games of all time, as you can probably tell by the music choice in some of my videos. The first three Silent Hill games are some of the best horror experiences you can get. I definitely see why they make this iceberg as the setting of the games along with the music really gives off a surreal and eerie kind of vibe. It makes the games feel like a fever dream. I'm not gonna go into the Silent Hill wall in this video because I could talk about it for hours, but I'll give a brief explanation in case you haven't played them. The first Silent Hill games follows Harry Mason as he searches for his missing adopted daughter in the town of Silent Hill. The second game, my favorite one, you guide the character James Sunderland around the town as it goes into more depth of the town's backstory. In Silent Hill 3, you play as Heather as she returns to the town to do some stuff. I, I don't know, I haven't played the third one. I'm not gonna mention the other games as they're not 
that good in my opinion but i will mention pt pt standing for playable teaser was a demo for the next installment in the franchise silent hills however shortly after konami announced that they were cancelling silent hills and took the demo off the playstation store the only way you can play it now is to buy a console with it already downloaded and unless you're bill gates um you can forget ever playing it. Xeno Clash. Xeno Clash is the only game on this first tier that I've never heard of. Xeno Clash is a first person fighting video game with elements of a first person shooter that was released on Steam in 2009. Players assume the role of Gat and progress through the world of Xenozoic visiting various locations in a linear sequence. Looking at the gameplay of this game, I can definitely see why it's described as surreal. I mean, just look at this. While researching the game, I I saw that apparently it was in development since the 1990s, taking about 20 years to make. That's... that's pretty impressive. The game's combat system is quite unique, as it plays like a normal fighting game, kinda like Tekken or Street Fighter, except for the fact that you play in first person. I'm not ragging on the game or anything, but watching gameplay kinda reminds me of those god-awful ads that you see for mobile games. Jazz Punk. Oof. I completely forgot this game existed. While I've never played Jazz Punk, I vividly remember watching Jacksepticeye play it back when I was a kid. Jazz Punk is a single player first person adventure game focusing on exploration and comedy over puzzle solving. Each mission has one central objective, but the player is free to explore the game world at their own pace, which is populated with a large number of interactive NPCs, each with their own action or gag. Mini games including Mini Golf, a Frogger clone, and a version of Duck Hunt in which the player pelts cardboard dust with slices of bread from a toaster. What makes this game surreal is, well, the setting and the way the NPCs interact with you. Something about it all just feels kinda off. LSD Dream Emulator. LSD Dream Emulator is the definition of surreal, as you can probably tell by its name. Before I talk about the game itself, I gotta talk about the maker. Osamu Sato. Sato started out his career in photography, but later branched out to computer arts in the 90s. After experimenting with CD-ROM technology, he wanted to use the PlayStation as a means of creating music and art, even though he rejected the idea of video games. From there, he got the idea of creating an imaginary world with the same irrationally and easily forgettable nature as dreams. He did not give the game any objectives because, according to him, they are not essential in video games because even natural human existence cannot be reduced to simple objectives. For inspiration, Sato pulled ideas from a dream diary written by Hiroko Nishikawa, a game designer at Asimic Ace Entertainment who had been writing in the diary for about a decade. This game is great, and I highly recommend it as an experience everyone should have if you're interested in this stuff. Well, finding a copy of the game is almost impossible due to its slow distribution. You can always do the unthinkable and emulate it if you really want to. Katamari Damacy. Katamari Damacy has got to be my all-time favorite game franchise. Whenever I have a bad day, just Loading up Katamari Damacy reroll on Steam instantly cures my depression. Kind of strange how most of my favorite games are on this iceberg. Yikes. What makes the Katamari Damacy game so surreal is its typical Japanese goofy humor that can be seen in other games I've mentioned, such as WarioWare. The game's plot details a prince on the mission to rebuild the stars, constellations, and moon, which were inadvertently destroyed by his father, the king of all cosmos. This is achieved by rolling a magical, highly adhesive ball called a katamari around various locations, collecting increasingly larger objects, ranging from thumbtacks to human beings to mountains, until the ball has grown large enough to become a star. Katamari Damacy's story, settings, and characters are highly stylized and surreal, often both celebrating and satirizing facets of Japan culture. Popular RPG horror games. This entry is quite broad and refers to what I think is the largely oversaturated genre of RPG maker horror games. Yume Nikki, which was the first entry on the iceberg, is one of these. These games are genuinely more of the same, but here are some notable ones. Mad Father, Ao Oni, Crooked Man, 
Purgatory, and Dice Psycho, just to name a few. Puppet Combo Games. This entry refers to the games created by the indie studio, Puppet Combo Games. I'm gonna link their itch.io site in the description as I've played most of their games and I gotta say, they're freaking amazing. They make PS2 style horror games that are inspired by 80s era, VHS horror movies, and as you can see from the aesthetic I use in my videos, these games are right up my alley. The word surreal doesn't even begin to describe these games and I highly recommend you check them out. Definitely Definitely start by playing The Glass Staircase, as it's a homage to survival horror games like the previously mentioned Silent Hill, Post Void. The best word I can use to describe this game is fun. Post Void is described as a hypnotic scramble of early first person shooter design that values speed above all else. The game has a messy yet pleasing art style that makes the visuals feel very surreal and dreamlike. It plays like a roguelike dungeon crawler combined with a fast pace FPS. It kind of plays like Doom, but on heroin. American McGee's Alice. <sighs> this game gave me nightmares as a kid. The game is a spin of Alice in Wonderland by this guy named American McGee. This game is quite disturbing to say the least. Its setting and tone really adds to the surrealness of the game. As if Alice in Wonderland wasn't surreal enough, you just had to make it worse. The game was quite successful with a sequel coming out for it 11 years later in 2011. Hong Kong 97. Oh boy, Hong Kong 97 or as I like to call it, the Mona Lisa of video games, is an unlicensed shoot 'em up developed by HappySoft. It was designed by the Japanese game journalist, Perlun Kurosawa, who claims the game is a satire of the video game industry, and was apparently made in two days. Let me just read the plot for the game off Wikipedia, and you'll see why this game is on the iceberg. The game takes place in China, 1997, during the handover of Hong Kong from the United Kingdom. Facing an increased crime rate, Due to the immigration from mainland China, the Hong Kong government hires Chin, a super powerful relative of Bruce Lee, to kill the entire population of China. At the same time, the deceased Tong Xiaoping is resurrected by a secret project conducted by the Chinese government as an ultimate weapon. After defeating Tong Xiaoping, the game is repeated indefinitely until Chin dies. The game sold very well, with a whopping 30 copies being sold. Since the video by AVGN reviewing the game it gained quite a cult following due to its lackluster quality. Deadly Premonition Deadly Premonition is an open world survival horror game released in 2010. Set in the fictional rural American town of Greenvale, Washington, the story follows FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan as he investigates the murder of an 18 year old woman which bears similarities to a series of murders across the country. The game was released with mixed reviews and and was compared to a subpar Silent Hill. Personally, I don't mind it, but replaying it, it hasn't really aged too well. What makes the game surreal is its combat sequences that take place in the other world. You periodically visit two supernatural rooms, the white room and the red room. The white room represents a normal subconscious, while the red room represents one influenced by evil. It's honestly not too bad and is definitely underrated and forgotten about when compared to similar survival horror games. Pony Island. Pony Island is another banger of a game from 2016 that you may have heard of from the hundreds of let's plays that were made of the game. The game is not about ponies. The gimmick of Pony Island is that it lures the player in by appearing to be a retro arcade game about ponies, but as you progress, the game turns dark and it turns out you're trapped in an arcade machine created by the devil himself. This bait and switch gimmick of the game made for some perfect YouTube content back in the day and has since been forgotten about. Stanley Parable. If you don't know what the Stanley Stanley Parable is, which I don't know how you couldn't. The Stanley Parable is a Half-Life 2 mod that was later released onto Steam as a standalone game in 2013. In the game, the player guides a silent protagonist named Stanley alongside narration by British actor Kevin Brighting. As the story progresses, the player is confronted with diverging pathways. The player may contradict the narrator's directions, which if disobeyed, will then be incorporated into the story. Depending on the choices made, the player will encounter different endings before the game resets to the beginning. The setting of the game is what gives it the surreal feeling, with it taking place in an empty office building. The tone of the game can be compared to those liminal space photos that you always see. 
The Binding of Isaac. The Binding of Isaac is probably the best roguelike I've ever played. At first, I was like, why is this on the iceberg? But I guess I can see how it can be seen as surreal to some people. Especially the biblical elements might come off as bizarre to some people, but personally, I don't really see it as surreal. The Binding of Isaac is a roguelike video game designed by the independent developers Edmund McMillan and Florian Himsel, released in 2011. The game's title and plot are inspired by the biblical story of the Binding of Isaac. In the game, Isaac's mother receives a message from God demanding the life of her son as proof of her faith, and Isaac, fearing for his life, flees into a monster-filled basement of their home, where he must fight to survive. Players control Isaac, or one of seven other unlockable characters, through a procedurally generated dungeon in a roguelike manner, defeating monsters in real-time combat while collecting items and power-ups to defeat bosses and eventually Isaac's mother. The game has since been remade with Isaac Rebirth in 2014 and will always remain as one of, if not the, best indie game. Pikmin. What's this doing on here? Pikmin is a real-time strategy and puzzle game series created by Shigeru Miyamoto and published by Nintendo. The game focuses on directing a horde of plant-like creatures called Pikmin in order to collect items by destroying obstacles, avoiding hazards, and fighting fauna that are hazardous to both the player and Pikmin. The Pikmin series features five main entries, as well as a spin-off. I guess I can see how Pikmin can be seen as surreal, but uh, I don't know. I guess I'm just used to the weirdness of most Nintendo games. Speaking of weird Nintendo games, Tomodachi Life. Damn, I have some good memories with this game. Tomodachi Life is a social simulation video game created by Nintendo for the 3DS in 2013. The game takes advantage of the Mii character creator that was available on the 3DS, allowing the player to import their own characters and take care of them in a way not too dissimilar from The Sims. What makes this game surreal is the Miis. Uh, just look at these things. The most notable thing for me in Tomodachi Life is the ability to change your muse voice. Just, just listen to these guys. Nobby Nobby Boy. Nobby Nobby Boy is a video game for the PlayStation 3 and iOS, developed by Kaita Takahashi and published by Namco Bandai. In the game, the player controls the character Nobby Boy, who can stretch his body. One of the meanings of Nobby is stretch in Japanese. Nobby Nobby also means carefree in Japanese, so the game's title is a play in words with both of the meanings. The visuals of the game are very similar to Katamari Damacy, the game I was talking about before. Which which, I mean, it was made by the same studio, so that makes sense. While, in my opinion, not as good as Katamari, it's still a decent game. The game is, uh, definitely surreal, to say the least. Deltarune. Deltarune is the second game released by Toby Fox, and is quite similar to Undertale, which I mentioned before. The game is also inspired by games like Earthbound, and has the same surreal aspects as Undertale. While it's not technically a sequel to Undertale, they're kinda one in the same, being really similar, and, I mean, they both have stands. Deltarune is honestly a pretty good game, with two out of the five chapters being released. The game, while not that surreal, definitely has its bizarre moments. Golden Lion. While I haven't played Golden Lion, I've seen gameplay of it, and I gotta say, this game is quite disturbing. I'm not sure, but something about the meat and the gratuitous amount of grizzliness just sends chills down my spine. Golden Light is described as a procedural dark comedy horror game with roguelike elements and an eerie atmosphere. Looking at screen caps of the game, you can see why it's described as surreal. While disturbing, I kinda like the cell shaded art style. It's pretty cool looking. The Lisa series. Ah oh boy, this, this makes me tear up just thinking about it. The Lisa series is quite the depressing set of games. While I haven't played the first game, Lisa the First. I have played the second game, Lisa the Painful. I know this isn't very Giga Chad Sigma male of me, but it's the only game that has actually made me cry. The first game, Lisa the First, is somewhat similar to Yume Nikki, where you explore the mind of Lisa Armstrong as she tries to cope with the abuse of her father, Marty. Because of the game's subject matter, the game is a bit depressing, as you might imagine. Its sequel, Lisa the Painful, follows Lisa's brother, Brad, in a post-apocalyptic world called Olaf. 
Brad ends up adopting a daughter and raises it with his buddies until one day she is kidnapped. This game is less like the first and is more RPG like with a combat system not too different from Earthbound. Despite the depressing ending, the combat is really solid and the comedic writing is near perfect and it's all wrapped together with a perfect atmospheric soundtrack. I won't spoil the ending here, but if you want to know more about it, let me know because I would love to make a video analysing it. Facade. Facade is yet another classic game that I remember seeing Let's Players play back in the day. Facade is an artificial intelligence based interactive story from 2005. In Facade, you are invited over for cocktails at your friend's apartment along with your friend, his wife is also there, and their relationship is less than stellar. What makes this game so well known is the fact that you can say anything you want to the couple with the use of your keyboard. Think of AI Dungeon, except it's not text based and you can actually experience the result of what you say. As you can see from the gameplay, this game is uh, quite surreal with a slightly off cell shaded art style. The thing about Facade that creeps me out is the way that the couple just constantly stares at you. It's very uncanny. Superliminal. This game is a is a mind trip, dude. Superliminal is a surreal puzzle game made by Pillow Castle Games in 2019. The game, played from a first person perspective, incorporates gameplay elements around optical illusions and force perspective. Notably, certain objects, when picked up, can be moved towards or away from the player but when placed back down, scale to size as the player had viewed them, enabling the player to solve puzzles to complete the game. Playing this game just makes you feel like you're either lucid dreaming or tripping balls. Franbo. Damn, I, I find this game more disturbing than I do surreal. Franbo is a creepy adventure game that tells the story of Fran, a young girl struggling with a mental disorder and an unfair destiny. Set in 1944, the game tells the story of Fran, a 10 year old girl struggling with mental illness after witnessing the murder of her parents. She's then found alone in the woods and admitted to Oswald Asylum, separating Fran from her black cat and only friend, Mr. Midnight. Again, while I haven't played Franbo, it's one of those horror games that Let's Players used to play back in the day, which is where it got most of its popularity. Antichamber. The last surreal game in tier 1 we've got is Antichamber. Antichamber is an Australian a first person puzzle platform game from 2013. In Antichamber, you wander from level to level, making your way through a dreamlike Euclidean space. The game often takes advantage of those impossible objects that you see and your brain just can't make sense of. The game has a real trippy dreamlike soundtrack that honestly kinda slaps. Essentially, the game's a mind trip from start to finish. Very interesting RPG maker game from 2003. To be honest, um, while I played this game, I kind of found it hard to understand what was going on. You play as a kid named Philip, who sort of looks like a crying nutsack. As you go on an adventure to find the legendary City of Forms with your best pal, Leg Horse. The game, while it's more funny than anything is quite disturbing at times with a lot of the things in the game being centered around blood like there's just blood everywhere the combat is your standard rpg maker stuff but i do have to say that the game's soundtrack is pretty solid the wacky shenanigans of this game are quite surreal i guess you could say juice galaxy oh boy where do i even begin to talk about this game after playing this game for a few hours i've come to the conclusion that this is so far the best game on the iceberg i doubt anything else will be able to top it but We'll see, I guess. In Juice Galaxy, you play as a guy made of juice in a galaxy made of juice, in which you roam around said galaxy and defeat weird blob enemies made of juice to gain juice particles and level up your juice abilities. If I say juice one more time, I will have a brain aneurysm. This game is really, really, really fun. And I could, I could just fly around the Juice Galaxy hitting guys with a baseball bat for days straight. The ambient soundtrack combined with its surreal and desolate setting is what lands it this far down on the iceberg. I really recommend you play it. It's completely free on itch.io and is definitely worth your time. Cruelty Squad. If someone was to ask me, what do you mean by a surreal game? I would tell them to play Cruelty Squad. Calling this game surreal is an understatement. As you can see by the gameplay, this game is quite the fever dream. Just looking at Cruelty Squad can make you feel sick. 
but it passes most essential immersive sim tests with bright, nauseating colours. Cruelty Squad is what you would get if you remade Deus Ex, but you were overdosing on magic mushrooms during the process. In Cruelty Squad, you play as a depressed assassin for hire in the bad future, killing on behalf of the Cruelty Squad, a depraved subsidiary company tasked with performing wet works for its host conglomerate. The structure of the game is pretty similar to Hitman. You pick some guns and some tools, then explore a massive level, avoiding or killing guards, finding efficient routes and vantages for a clean, quick kill. Don't start a riot in the comments, please, but I'm, I'm not too fond of this game, to be honest. There's plenty of games that are very similar to Cruelty Squad, with the same surreal art style, but Cruelty Squad just overdoes it to the point where the gameplay is sacrificed to make the game more aesthetic. Like, the, the texturing in some of the levels is just messy, and I know that's what the game is trying to be, but that doesn't change the fact that a lot of areas in the game are just painful to look at. Megami Tensei 1987 Shin Megami Tensei is a 1987 game developed by Atlas for the Famicom. The story sees Japanese high school students Akami Nakajima Yumiko Shirasagi combat the forces of Lucifer, unleashed by a demon summoning program created by Nakajima. The gameplay features first-person dungeon crawling and turn-based battles or negotiation with demons and a journey through a hostile labyrinth as Nakajima featuring real-time combat. This game has quite the amazing soundtrack and the combat was very unique at the time, allowing you to capture enemies and use them in battle. It basically did what Pokemon did, but 10 years earlier. What makes this game surreal is the dreamlike nature of the levels that you explore, along with the bizarre biblical elements that really feel quite trippy at times. The game has quite a lot of sequels, with Shin Megami Tensei 5 coming out last year. The Neverhood. The Neverhood is a 1996 point and click adventure game developed by The Neverhood Inc. and published by DreamWorks Interactive for Microsoft Windows. The game follows the adventure of a claymation character named Clayman as he discovers his origins and his purpose in a world made entirely of clay. When the game was originally released, it was unique in that all of its animation was done entirely by claymation, including all of the sets, rather than two or three dimensional computer graphics like many other games at the time. It's a pity I can't find a copy of this game because I, I really want to play it. The art style just looks so cool. Because of the surreal nature of most claymation art, you can probably see why it makes this iceberg. I'm Scared. I'm Scared is an indie horror game created by Ivan Zanotti from 2012 that was later released on Steam in 2016. This game features an unnamed protagonist in a room unable to escape due to the door needing a heart to open it. Upon the players investigating, they find a little key under the table. This key can be used to open the wardrobe, revealing blood to be inside it. This reveals a hidden entrance to the bottom left of the room. This game deceives the player quite a lot, in which the player has to change files in a folder that the game creates on the user's desktop in order to progress. Because of the fourth wall breaking, there's quite a lot of rumours surrounding it saying that the game has viruses in it. This fourth wall breaking, along with the vague and cryptic nature of the plot, makes it such a surreal experience. Walking simulators slash dream walkers. This is another entry on the iceberg that is like a category of games. Walking simulators are a minimalist genre of games that lack many of the traditional aspects of gameplay, such as a goal, win and lose conditions, or combat. Instead, they focus on discovery and story through walking, exploration, and interaction with non-hazardous items in the environment. They sometimes feature puzzles, but these are infrequent or non-existent altogether, and are never a key aspect of gameplay. Enemies or some other threat may be present, but death is rarely a risk to the player. Instead, some other form of punishment, loss, or setback may be implemented. As you'll see later on, uh, there's quite a lot of walking simulators on this iceberg. Sit and Spin Adventure 1 and 2. These two games are really interesting. I guess you could say. If stuff like this is only in the second tier, I'm, I'm terrified to see what's towards the bottom. The sit and spin adventure games are point and click adventure games that are made with art from other games and the internet. 
In the game, you play as a sit and spin, and you roam around and interact with wacky stuff, going from wacky location to wacky locations. The developer describes the game as two video games designed and programmed using art and music from the internet and other games. Originally intended as a proof of concept for a short adventure game, the first sit and spin adventures development quickly transformed into an experiment in found imagery collage and non sequitur exploration. It was developed over the course of three months, as you can probably tell. The sequel built upon the themes seen in the first game, while also adding in new styles of gameplay and a greater number of locations and quests to complete Worlds.com. Worlds.com is an online virtual reality based chat program introduced in April 1995 by the company Worlds Inc and is currently still online as of the time of this video. A Worlds.com user is allowed to choose from a gallery of existing three-dimensional avatars to be their representation in the virtual world. The gallery is presented in a fashion similar to that of a first-person shooter, except without the hands and weapon. Once an avatar was chosen, the user was placed in a central hub of a virtual space station. The user would see representations of other online users in this station. This game is, uh quite bizarre and honestly kind of eerie. The game has garnered a bunch of attention due to its uh, questionable users on the game. Apparently the game is filled with real world cults and is used for these questionable individuals to communicate. I recommend watching Nexpo's video where he goes in more depth on these cults in the game and it's, it's quite disturbing. Toilet in Wonderland. Oh boy. Toilet in Wonderland is an adventure game where a constipated girl named Mira explores a toilet filled wonderland inhabited with many wacky characters. You wander around this wonderland collecting laxatives to lower your constipation level and collect toilets from different areas of the game. This game is bizarre, as you can probably tell from the gameplay, and it is, it's, it's quite fun though. I managed to beat it in like three hours, but during that time I had I had a lot of fun. I was really surprised that I haven't heard of this game till now. It's, it, it is apparently popular in the RPG maker community, but I haven't heard of it before. I recommend playing it. It's it's really good. Oh, just a warning, it can get uh, disturbing at some times. Yuta Hono Tatari. Yuta Hono Tatari is an RPG maker game that kind of got lost under the radar and has never been translated to my knowledge. I played it for a bit and I had no idea what was happening, as my Japanese is a bit rusty. In the game, you play as a girl and explore what seems to be an abandoned haunted house. This game is known for its jump scares that really catch you off guard. Other than that, there's not too much to the game, it's it's just another spooky Japanese RPG maker game. Soda Drinker Pro Soda Drinker Pro is the world's most advanced soda drinking simulator. The player uses the keyboard controls to walk around the soda drinking simulator, while the mouse is used to look around the simulation. The left mouse button places the soda into the player's mouth, while the right mouse button sips the soda. The soda has to be at the player's mouth for the soda to be sipped. There is a soda meter in the upper left hand corner of the game that measures the amount of soda left in the player's cup. Once the player has successfully completed drinking the soda, they can move to the next simulation. Throughout the environment, there are bonus sodas which can be collected. While this game has quite a lot of negative reviews with a 30 out of 100 score on Metacritic, I think this game is a banger. This game is quite, quite the trip. Uh, just just watch the game's trailer. Revenge of the Sunfish. This is one of the games I was talking about earlier, where I said I just had to stop playing, otherwise I would I would have had a stroke. Revenge of the Sunfish is a collection of games created by Jacob W. Bukzinki in 2007. The game has been heavily played by many YouTubers, but due to the fact that this game is a joke and nothing else, hardly anyone has uh, criticized it. Everything was done using the Game Factory program, and the graphics were made entirely in Microsoft Paint. The game itself, however, was not fully completed because the hard drive the game was on during the creation crashed and needed to be repaired. So the current state of the game is a fraction of what was originally planned. According to the creator, the basic idea is that every level is supposed to be a different game, playable on its own. Games with very diverse gameplay are hard to find, so he always wanted to create a game like that. It's not 
that good. When I when I played it, I almost had a stroke. Like after after ten minutes of playing, I could literally feel my brain vibrating and asking me to stop. Just just look at this. Yes, 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 yes. Harder, harder. Everhood. I don't know why it's this far down, because I mean it's pretty popular. This game is really, really special to me. The first time I played it, I just I just fell in love with it. Everhood definitely has the best soundtrack out of any game, hands down. The game is described as an unconventional adventure RPG that takes place in an inexpressible world filled with amusing musical battles and strange, delightful encounters. Personally, I would describe it as Undertale, but except for bullet hell combat, it's, it's a rhythm game. Everhood has a similar story to many you'll hear. A passion project brought to fruition after years of hard work. Its inspiration in Undertale is very clear, but that never holds it back as standing out as its own thing. Although it shares similarities with Undertale, Everhood is much more bizarre and surreal. I highly recommend playing it. It's definitely one of the best indie games I've ever played. Hypnospace Outlaw Hypnospace Outlaw is a simulation game developed by Tendershoot in 2019. Set in an alternate history 1999, the game takes place inside a parody of the early internet and its culture that uses visit in their sleep called hypnospace the player assumes the role of an enforcer for the fictional company merchantsoft creator of hypnospace and seeks to police illegal content copyright violations viruses and cyberbullying by users on the service in the process, the player engages in detective work and puzzle solving. This game takes advantage of the late 90s internet aesthetic to offer a more surreal and exaggerated experience. Middens Middens is an RPG maker game by indie developer My Former Selves from 2013. Playing as a figure known only as the Nomad, who flees his home dimension when his beloved culture dies via assimilation, you find yourself in an area called the Rift. The Rift is essentially the scrapyard of the universes, where all the dimension or parts of dimensions that were unwanted or broken are sent to rot. A world of anarchy, every being in the Rift is an immigrant who fled their home dimension taking a chunk of it with them. From the synopsis and the gameplay, you can see how this game is surreal in every sense of the word. You May Nikki Fan Games. This entry refers to the large amount of fan games created for You May Nikki. You May Nikki is that RPG maker game that was the first entry on the iceberg back in tier one. Most fan games use the setting and plot of You May Nikki to expand on its ideas shown in the game and create homages to You May Nikki with RPG Maker. Some notable You May Nikki fan Fan games include Dot Flow, You May Tuki, Flesh Child, Me, and Device. Parentham Haru. Parentham Haru is yet another Japanese RPG Maker horror game from 1998. I did not until researching this game that the RPG Maker engine has been around since 92. The plot of Parentham Haru is the following. Professor Tsuchida is a leading expert on archaeology, goes on an unauthorized expedition into the unknown levels of the Great Pyramid of Giza with his assistant Koji Kuroi. They soon realize that the underground ruins are full of death traps when the excavator they hired is decapitated by a thin metal wire. Professor Tsuchida, unwilling to back down, goes outside the pyramid to lure a Japanese tour group nearby to act as his human shield. Inside the pyramid, one by one, the members of the entourage become subject to Khufu's punishment for their faults, but the professor insists on heading deeper into the complex, despite knowing the fatal dangers of the environment. The game is similar to other RPGs in that it involves exploration and random enemy encounters, but it focuses not on combat, but rather puzzle solving to save party members from punishment. The game's setting, along with the highly graphic nature of the game, is what makes it so surreal. Off. Off is a French RPG maker game from 2008 that was kinda hard to find information about, but I did, however, find a download link to it. Off is a pretty standard RPG maker game where you play as the bat 
batter, a man in a baseball uniform that is on a sacred mission to purify the world. You make your way through four separate zones, killing these enemies called spectres along the way. As you progress, you'll find out that these zones are tied to the Guardian's life energy, and that killing the Guardians will completely wipe out life in all the zones, which is revealed to be your player's true objective. This game has a really interesting plot and atmosphere, and for an RPG Maker game, the writing is pretty solid. After sitting through RPG Maker game after RPG Maker game, it's nice to have a game that's not just a joke game and is actually decent. Yuppie Psycho. Yuppie Psycho places you in the shoes of Brian Paxtonak, a young man with no future in a dystopian 1990s society. Upon receiving a mysterious letter offering a job at the headquarters of the megalithic corporation, Centricorp, Brian discovers a deep, dark, complex web of lies and horror. His job? Kill the witch causing the corruption in the company. On his first day of the job, Brian will meet all kinds of odd characters, escape from terrible creatures, and unravel the hidden secrets of Centricorp's dark past. Yuppie Psycho has a retro aesthetic from the golden age of the 90s, featuring anime-inspired cutscenes to immerse the player in an atypical horror story, loosely following the same basic gameplay template of a variety of classic 16-bit RPGs. Yuppie Psycho unites a myriad of different genres, including survival horror, graphic adventure, and puzzle solving. The overall game design also takes notes from titles such as Silent Hill and Deadly Premonition, two games that I also mentioned back in Tier 1. Burn Band. Although it's more of an experience than it is a game, Burn Band is pretty great. In Burn Band, you explore an alien cyberpunk city filled to the brim with hidden areas and a bunch of detail. It's actually pretty impressive how big the city is considering it's a free-to-play game from Game Jolt. This game is immersive as frick and there's something about the sound design that is just so atmospheric and relaxing. I highly recommend you give Burn Band a go, it's, it's pretty awesome. Sonic Dreams Collection. Oh god, it, it took me years to forget about this game and... Now it's back. Sonic Dreams Collection is a 2015 art game developed by Arcane Kids. It's an unofficial game based on Sega's Sonic the Hedgehog franchise that compiles four mini-games presented as unfinished Sonic games, but the game as a whole later reveals itself to be a psychological horror game, satirizing the modern Sonic fandom. They include the character creator, Make My Sonic, the massively multiplayer online role-playing game Eggman Origin, the adventure game Sonic Movie Maker, and the virtual reality game My Roommate Sonic. They are described in-game as having been developed by a non-existent Sega studio for the Dreamcast in the late 1990s. The most surreal part of the Dream Collection is definitely the My Roommate Sonic game. My Roommate Sonic is a virtual reality VR game presented from a first-person view. The player sits on a couch next to Sonic with Eggman encouraging the player by text message to pursue a romantic interest in him. If the player completes all these tasks, Sonic and the player prepare to kiss, only for Sonic's pupils to converge into a black hole that sucks the player's character and their phone in. The player then watches their character running through a distorted green hill zone and slowly morphing into a realistic headless version of Sonic. This game, uh used to be quite traumatizing back in the day. Seaman. Seaman, not to be confused with Seaman, is a virtual pet video game for the Sega Dreamcast. It's one of the few Dreamcast games that take advantage of the microphone attachment. The game developed a cult following for its dark humor, bizarre aesthetics, and innovative gameplay. Seaman was released multiple times, including a limited edition version titled Christmas Seaman that was released in Japan in 1999, alongside a limited edition Red Dreamcast and a PlayStation 2 version in 2001 titled Seaman Kinden no Pet, Gaze Hakushi no Jiken Shima, the first edition of the game that came with a microphone. A PC version for Microsoft Windows was also planned, with the Seaman being able to interact with the user's applications, kind of like Bonzi buddy. No release date was specified and it was later cancelled. A sequel called Seaman 2 was released in Japan for the PlayStation 2 in 2007. I haven't played Seaman because it's pretty hard to find a copy of the game for a decent price. The Battle Cats. <sighs> 
I used to be so addicted to this game. The Battle Cats is a free to play tower defense game developed by the Ponos Corporation for iOS and Android. The Battle Cats is a tower defense game where the player selects a team of in game unlockable cats with different stat amounts to defeat enemies in order to protect their base called Cat Base. The gameplay involves sending a wide roster of cats out into a 2D battlefield to defend the Cat Base. While Battle Cats is a lot more well known than the other games on this tier, it's definitely very very surreal. I mean, you can play as Hatsune Miku for God's sake. Hylix. Damn, why why are all my favorite games on this iceberg? Hylix is a banger of a game, described as a recreational program with light RPG elements that was released in 2015 by Mason Lindros. What makes this game so great, for me at least, is the well-made claymation graphics that are used throughout the game. The player character is Wayne, a humanoid being with yellow skin and crescent-shaped horns. Most of the game's NPCs speak using random text generation in a manner described as a deliberate misleading red herring, albeit consistent with the setting, with the player's goals being represented through environmental design instead. The world and characters are alluded to be post-human in nature, and the goal of the game is to defeat the King of the Moon, whose name is Gibby. Alex plays like a traditional JRPG, despite its surreal setting. Hit points are replaced with flesh, while magic points are replaced with will. Battles are shown from a first person perspective, with the character's hands being shown performing attacks. Wayne loses all of his flesh when defeated, but does not die, rather warping to an afterlife, from which they can travel back to a previous area. Battle items are also unusual, such as being able to attack with a frozen burrito. I also just have to mention the soundtrack, my god does it have some bangers on it. No Delivery. No Delivery is a procedurally generated CRPG pizzeria simulator where you are the newest in a long line of employees for a local decrepit pizza parlor. Despite the rumors, shady history, and missing person cases, you sign up for the night shift because it pays slightly more than all the kids' birthday parties should. The game roguelikes a new random character for you to play and go around this pizza parlor and do errands. As you wander around the map, there are wrong turn locations that you can fall into. These are like dungeons, and they all have have their own theme to them. For example, you might end up in a ball pit themed area with monsters coming out of the depths of the ball pit. While it's not too surreal, it's a pretty cool roguelike centered around delivering pizza. Mega Man Sprite Game Released on Halloween of 2012, in this RPG game, Mega Man and his brother Zero get into some trouble with some spooky ghost. The game is your average RPG maker game, except that it's an adaptation of the Mega Man Sprite comic. The Mega Man Sprite comic is an old webcomic that was made from crudely drawn Mega Man sprites, originally created by Samantha Gilson as a one-off parody of crappy sprite comics. The uniqueness of the Mega Man Sprite comics resulted in a surprisingly long-lived webcomic with a small but devoted fanbase, Johnny Series. The Johnny Series is a long list of games made by Mr. Krubus. As of May 2008, there have been 21 Johnny games. Because of the large number of Johnny games, two fan games have been made by CLY5M. The link on the iceberg brought me to this wiki page about the Johnny series, but I wasn't able to find a download or any gameplay anywhere, but it's apparently described by the Iceberg creator to have not so good graphics or gameplay. I did, however, manage to find this screenshot and uh, their description was pretty accurate. Total Distortion Total Distortion is a 1995 full motion adventure game for Mac and Windows developed by Pop Rocket. The gameplay has the player as a music video entrepreneur in the distortion dimension, a place where they can fight guitar warriors in guitar battles. The goal of the game is to get fame points, make money, and film successful music videos. The game was also known for its sense of humor. For example, the famous Game Over screen featured the enemy singing a song called you are dead. One of the most distinctive features of this game was the sleep mode. When the player went to sleep, a dream appeared which consisted of a mini game. If the player failed the dream sequence, it would result in a nightmare, which decreased mental energy, an important stat in the game. Yeah, um, early 90s full motion graphics really did make this game surreal. Gregory Horror Show Gregory Horror Show, known in Japan as Gregory Horror Show Soul Collector, is a mystery survival horror game based on the CGI anime series of the same name. The game was published by Capcom in 2003 for the PS2 and was released everywhere except America. Yeah, if 
if you've watched the Gregory Horror Show anime, then you can understand why this game is surreal. Suits, a business RPG. Suits, a business RPG is a hand-drawn black and white RPG maker game created by Technomancy Studios in 2016. It's a deliberately weird take on the JRPG. It's heavily inspired by the previously mentioned Earthbound series, and its juxtaposition of realistic elements and surreal humor. The game seems to be, at least in my opinion, a criticism of corporate America and the negatives of capitalism. Broken Reality. Broken Reality is a 3D exploration game developed by by Dynamic Media Triad from 2018 on Steam. It revolves around this online chat room from the year 2045 called Natem. As a new user, you are encouraged by the helpful one, Chan, to collect likes by clicking on ads, shopping, and helping out other users to become as popular as possible. Natem provides a variety of servers with vibrantly different retro aesthetics, influenced by both vaporwave and 90s pop culture, into a dizzily nostalgic and melancholy blend. All is not well in Natum, and early on you are asked by those in the know to help plumb its secrets. These bizarre areas you explore are what make this game surreal. I really love this game because, as you can tell by my videos, I really like the vaporwave aesthetic and yeah, this game uh, ticks all my boxes. Stray Cat Crossing Stray Cat Crossing is yet another surreal RPG maker, horror game from 2015 about a girl who wanders into a house looking to retrieve her favourite scarf and is met instead with a host of bizarre monsters and the saddening secrets of the family within. Stray Cat Crossing also draws upon stories such as Alice in Wonderland, Spirited Away, Pan's Labyrinth, and The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, from, from this you could probably see why this game is surreal. Jinjiva. God, this game is so good. Jinjiva is an RPG maker game created by the same developer that made Middens, a game that I covered in the last video. Set in the same surreal dystopian setting as Middens, you play as Jinjiva, a young woman with an old-fashioned clock winding key for her head, who was essentially an enslaved automation factory worker. The story begins with the Holy Mother Most High requesting your presence. When you speak to her, she accuses you of slacking off on your work and has you thrown in prison. However, in your prison cell, you meet with a sentient disembodied mouth referred to as the chatter teeth he uh, helps you escape prison now on the run from the evil corporate executives you must make your way through a bizarre corrupted world filled with danger in a quest to regain both your freedom and your humanity this game reminds me a lot of abe's odyssey with like the themes of corporate slave labor and they're both kind of in the same setting but um yeah this game is very surreal ena dream barbecue dream barbecue is an upcoming episode an interactive video game in the ENA series. It's considered to be the beginning of a new season of the series. If you don't already know, ENA is a Peruvian animated series present on YouTube and Newgrounds created by Joel Guriel. The series uses a mix of 2D and 3D animation and takes inspiration from many pieces of media and worldwide culture. The series takes place in a strange, almost post-apocalyptic world inhabited by bizarre characters and creatures. The overall tone of the series uses surreal and comedic elements. While it's not out yet, from what I can tell, it's just like the animated series, so um, yeah, the game will be quite surreal. Perfect Vermin. Perfect Vermin is an indie horror game by Maceo Bob Moa from 2020. The gameplay is pretty simple. You have a sledgehammer to destroy any objects that look out of place in an office building while being timed. A news reporter pops up to tell you that there is no time to Ways, and that there are more vermin hiding on the other floors. But as you destroy more objects, the reporter starts to become deformed. At the end of the game, you are in a doctor's office and it's revealed that your player has cancer. With this uh, sudden ending, combined with the themes of smoking throughout the game, the game makes me feel like uh, it's about destroying cancer cells in a body. Like, you, you make your way through a normal office destroying objects that are out of place, and once you destroy them, they explode into like a bloody mess. It's a bit of a stretch, but uh, I don't know, this is the only theory that I could make for this game. Plug and Play. Plug and Play is an interactive animation drawn by Michael Frey in 2015. In the game, you play through different scenarios involving plugs and people with plugs as heads. The game seems to be about love and technology. 
or something. The game was pretty popular back in the day with YouTubers such as Markiplier reacting to the surreal aspects of the game. I'm, uh, I'm not too sure why this one is so far down. Remediation, a dream emulator demo. Being heavily inspired by LSD Dream Emulator, a game I mentioned back in tier 1, this game is an exploration through spaces, some inspired by real dreams, or with the ambition of creating a sense of yearning and loneliness. These feelings can only be remediated by embracing dreams from a simpler state of mind. While this isn't a horror game, there are some pretty creepy visuals that might be unsettling for younger players. Like the LSD Dream Emulator, this game is less of a game and more of a surreal experience. 21 The World 21 The World is a surreal exploration game based on the developer's dream journal that he kept for years. Like the previous one, this game is also heavily inspired by LSD Dream Emulator. In the game, you start in the game dev's bedroom and go deeper and deeper into a dream rabbit hole by interacting with different objects. It was really cool to play and see how many different dreams I could discover. Tamashi. Inspired by obscure Japanese games from the 90s and late 80s, Tamashi is a unique puzzle platformer from 2019, set in a distorted world of striking horror and unsettling imagery. The game pulls inspiration from Lovecraft stories such as Cthulhu, so, so you can guess why this game might be surreal. Tamashi is uh, quite disturbing, and if you play it, uh, a lot of it will stick with you for a while. Despite the pretty solid art direction, this game is still not that that good of a platformer. It definitely puts its visuals before its gameplay. Emstain. Emstain is another one of those bizarre PS1 style horror games. In Emstain, you play as a guy that's applying for a job at a financial company in the big city. After meeting the owner, Emstain, Apparently the M doesn't stand for anything. You find out that he's part of a satanic cult and you are his next sacrifice. The game's twist is uh, pretty good and the sound design and visuals are very pleasing. While it's pretty short, it's still a really good game and you should definitely check it out. It's it's about 20 minutes long, I think. Insomnia. Insomnia was uh, quite the interesting experience. It's what I think is another dream emulator, or at least that's what it feels like. In Insomnia, you play through five different dream like sequences in the style of a PS1 horror game. We're going to be seeing a lot of these PS1 like horror games in the next couple of tiers, so uh, be prepared. The game left me feeling really confused, but I was also pretty satisfied with the visuals and the liminal space feeling of the levels. Throughout the experience, I was really expecting to be jump scared, but uh, thankfully that didn't happen un until the last level at least. Overall, it's a uh, pretty surreal. Uh, Go play it if you wanna, it's it's very short, but it's it's pretty sweet. Neka Yume. Neke Yume is another dream emulator that's also inspired by the LSD dream emulator that's in the style of a PS1 horror game. Again, you explore a cat-filled dream with a night and day cycle and dozens of randomized events. Even if you explore an area once, there is no guarantee that it will be the same upon your return. The soundtrack is so freaking good, man. The game is really fun and there's something about the music and the atmosphere of some of the areas that's just so satisfying. Or should I say, cat. It's fine. You Left Me. You Left Me is a dark, funny, surreal game about loneliness and loss, where you wake up in a mysterious world and have until night time to escape. It's pretty good, and you can tell a lot of care and effort was put into making it. The story, the music, and the art is, is all pretty solid. I don't want to spoil much, because I, I recommend you definitely play it. It's, um... Quite the sick experience. True Loop. True Loop is an adventure simulation game developed by Punchline and released in 2002 in Japan for the PlayStation 2, and then later in North America in 2007 as a GameStop exclusive. In True Loop, you play as a young man who has just moved to a new town and next door to the girl of his dreams. Although she wants nothing to do with him due to his family's poor economic status, he decides to write her a heartfelt letter. When the letter is stolen, it is up to the protagonist to travel around the village and retrieve all of its pieces. The gameplay of Chulet revolves around improving the player's reputation with all the citizens in order to access all the parts of the town. To do this, the player must impress each member of the community and then kiss them. It's, uh, I think it's mostly the art of the game that makes it surreal.
and uh, also th those those lips. Cosmo D's Games. Cosmo D is a game developer that makes surreal, musically driven narrative adventure games. Some of his games include Off Peak, The Norwood Suite, and Tales from Off Peak City. He makes his own music for these games, and uh, I gotta say, their, their soundtracks are quite nutty. At first glance, they look like uh, those lazily made Unity games, but after playing some of them, I gotta say, they're they're pretty solid. OK Normal. OK Normal is a short, experimental third-person horror experience inspired by early 3D console games of the 90s. In the game, you journey through a dark, disjointed, dreamlike dimension with your cloud companion. While the game is really immersive and the atmosphere is very well put together, the, the controls are not the best, especially the, the jumping. But I guess that's a, that's a part of what makes it an early 3D 90s game. Sludge Life. Sludge Life is described as a first person open world vandalism centric stroll through a polluted island full of cranky idiots and a vibe so thick you can taste it. You roam a tiny island stuck on a sludge covered planet as an upcoming tagger ghost set on staking their claim amongst the graffiti elite. You traverse the corporately branded landscape, chat up other taggers and discover secrets and idiots along the way. The game is uh, pretty well known considering it was picked up and published by Devolver Digital, but it's still quite the surreal experience. The art design is just beautiful to say the least and the, the music is uh, pretty pretty, pretty top tier. Monument Valley. Why, why is this so far down? Monument Valley is an indie puzzle game developed and published by Us2 Games in 2014. You've probably heard of it if you have an iPhone because it's heavily advertised, well for me at least, on the iOS app store. In Monument Valley, you play as Ida, journeying through mazes of optical illusions and impossible objects, which are referred to as sacred geometry in game, as she journeys to be forgiven for something. The game is presented in an isometric view and the player interacts with the environment to find hidden passages as Ida progresses to the map's exit. The game is really relaxing and I, I wouldn't really call it surreal, it's uh, it's more minimalist than anything. Super Mario 64 build 3313. B3313 or build 3313, also called Super Mario 64 Internal Plexus, is a ROM hack of Super Mario 64 developed by Chris Brutal Aggression and his dev team. It's, well, at least I think, it's the largest Super Mario 64 hack to date, especially regarding the number of accessible areas, but also the star count and various other aspects. It's currently still in development, with the latest public release being version 0.7. The plot of the game is largely up to interpretation, although it appears is that the Mario Brothers are stuck in the aforementioned internal plexus. They're frantically looking for a way out while being haunted by an evil entity, presumably the personalization AI, as it takes the form of eerie liminal spaces, sinister NPC messages, and other phenomena. Additionally, Bowser has stolen the princess again, although this might just be another manifestation of whatever the brothers are trying to escape. The game uh, plays off that whole uh, uh, Super Mario 64 iceberg meme, where like the, the last tier was like, every copy of Mario was um, personalized, and um, the castle is like, uh, an internal plexus, which is like a brain thing, I don't know. Apparently the 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 main villain is the personalization AI, which uh, is up to interpretation. Despite being a ROM hack, this game is definitely large enough to be considered its own thing. Strangeland. This game is uh, pretty, pretty nutty. Strangeland is a surreal point-and-click adventure game from 2021. The game takes place in this surreal, carnival-inspired place that is floating in an unknown void. <laughs> I, I guess you could say the game takes place in a in a strange land. The setting of the game manages to be quite disturbing at times, but also very interesting. What I like about the game is that while it shows a large amount of stuff, like body mutilation and other various things, the narrative behind these disturbing depictions stop it from feeling gratuitous. The game is pretty fun to play, but uh, kind of dragged out a bit too long. So if you if you have the time to spare, definitely check it out. It's it's on Steam. Etherain Games. This entry refers to the indie game dev Etherain. Etherain. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Is an Estonian game dev primarily known for her Hello Charlotte games. Their games are quite similar to Omori in their surrealness, a, a game I mentioned back in tier 1, and have quite solid writing from what I hear. I've heard them be described as the Evangelion of uh, RPG maker games, which 
which sounds about right. Who's Lila? Who's Lila? I don't, I don't know, who, who is Lila? Who's Lila is a point-and-click adventure game from 2021, where instead of choosing dialogue options, you control the character's face manually. This game, surprisingly, isn't very well known, and I enjoyed it quite a lot. It got uh, quite disturbing at times, but the visuals along with the main gameplay mechanic definitely made it uh, surreal to experience. Anodine. Anodine is an action-adventure video game developed by Analgesic Productions from 2013. Anodine is a pretty cool game, and uh, is what the result would be if Link's Awakening and Yume Nikki had a baby. Anodine is played by exploring a dream world of the game's protagonist, Young. The gameplay involves the use of two primary items, a broom and shoes for jumping. I really enjoyed the mix of action-packed gameplay with the immersive, surreal atmosphere that was heavily supported by the game's soundtrack. Damn, does this game sound track slap. Bad Mojo. Bad Mojo, often described as the Roach game, is an adventure video game created by Pulse Entertainment in 1996. This uh, this tier is a bit wacky. We have like recently made indie games and also games from the from the 90s. In Bad Mojo, you play as Roger Sams, an etymologist planning to embezzle money from a research grant to escape his sordid life above an abandoned bar. The storyline in Bad Mojo is loosely based off a novel from 1915 called The Metamorphosis. Something about the visuals of this game really creeps me out. Like, a lot of sections in the game are just very hard to look at. Death Flush. I, I love this game so much. Death Flush is another PS1 style horror game made by the same dev that made M Stain. This game is really great and it's pretty short, but uh, before I give a rundown on it, I, I definitely recommend you play it. Oh. I'll put a link in the description. In Death Flush, you play as Ronnie, a guy that witnessed the murder of his grandpa while he was taking a whiz by some sort of serial killer. While watching TV with your girlfriend, you get a sudden urge to take a piss, as one does. But Ronnie is hesitant. You see, he has a phobia of pissing alone, due to seeing his grandpa get murdered while pissing. After violently splurging out a fat stream into the toilet, the bathroom door locks and you can't get out. Eventually, your granddad's killer kidnaps you from the toilet bowl. You then take control of Ronnie's girlfriend and you make your way through a demonic hellscape to rescue your boyfriend. After a very climatic boss battle, you make your escape. Back at Ronnie's apartment, the killer comes out of the toilet once more, but the moment he leaves the bathroom, he evaporates. This game, like M Stain, is an absolute banger and I, I really hope the guy that made it continues to make more games like this. Lost in Vivo. You've probably heard of this game as it was pretty popular on YouTube at one point, but uh, in case you haven't, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it. Lost in Vivo is a 2018 horror game that is centered around claustrophobia, the fear of tight and small places. During a storm, your service dog is forced down a broken sewer drain. You find the nearest sewer entrance and make a run after it. Along the way, you meet others that are also stricken by abnormal or psychological fear. The game is very well made, and it definitely gives a great representation of what it's like to be claustrophobic. Siphonopolis. This um game is quite hard to explain, but I'm gonna try anyway. Siphonopolis is a great example of the kind of games that we're gonna be seeing going deeper down the iceberg. Siphonopolis can be called a point-and-click game, but it's a... Uh, rather odd one. There's some puzzles in the game, but they definitely aren't the main focus. Most of your time in the game is spent swimming through surreal landscapes, fighting bizarre creatures in bullet hell combat, and running away from the ones you can't shoot. Its visuals are, um, a bit, a bit surreal. The game looks like what I think a stroke victim would see. The game kind of looks like that thing where you close your eyes and you rub them and you see like the light fade in and out and it's all trippy looking. I don't know that might that might just be me. Starting off in tier 3 we have Mario the Music Box. Mario the Music Box, also known as Mario the Music Box Classic, is a free fan-made RPG horror game created by Team Ari. The game gets most of its inspiration from other classic RPG mega games, such as Mad Father and Corpse Party. While the game features Mario, it's um not your usual Nintendo game. Despite having Mario as a playable character, the game doesn't actually take place in the Mushroom Kingdom, but in an abandoned mansion. After hearing some rumors about people disappearing from a mansion, Mario decides to investigate it. After entering the house, you find this music 
music box playing by itself. After grabbing it out of curiosity, the front door of the house disappears and Mario gets trapped in the mansion. The whole point of the game is to get out of the mansion while learning a bit more about the people that used to live there before they went missing. This game is literally just Corpse Party but with Mario for some reason. Yeah, having Mario in a RPG make a horror game definitely feels a bit surreal. The game is well known for its death scenes that are quite abundant and feature very graphic art. While it's pretty spooky and a bit surreal, I'm not too sure why it's down this far. Crypt Worlds, oof, I've been waiting to talk about this one. This game is amazing. Definitely my new favourite game from the iceberg. Crypt Worlds is an adventure game by the developer Lilith Zone. We'll be uh, seeing a lot of her games on this iceberg. In Crypt Worlds, you go on a quest to save the world. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, it isn't. When you first get into the game, you're given the goal. Find the five goddess relics and bring them back to the unicorn goddess so that you can defeat Dendigar, who is otherwise going to destroy the world in 50 days. Epic. The art in the game is really pretty. It uses grainy JPEG images that are placed onto objects and characters, and it has that classic nostalgic adventure game feel. The game's not too long and is really great, and it's also free, so you should definitely play it. Just a warning though, do not piss on the archaeologist, everything is going to be okay. This game's pretty cool, but holy f does it hurt my eyes. This game, or should I say, experience, is a collection of mini games that revolve around the theme of coping and survival. It kind of reminds me of Revenge of the Sunfish, that game I covered a few videos back. The developer describes the game as a desktop labyrinth of poetry, strange fever dream games, and broken digital spaces. It's a collection of life experiences that are largely a commentary on struggle, survival, and coping with the aftermath of surviving bad things. On the surface, it comes off as a dark comedy, and humour is a prevalent theme, but as you interact, the theme starts to unravel and facilitate what I hope to be a deeper discussion about these topics. Le Fantabulous Game and Other Egg Likes This entry refers to the category of surreal games called Egg Likes. I think like the, the best way to describe this genre is like walking simulators, not as good. The term egg-like refers to a game genre that features games that are egg-like. That's it. Most people recall the fantastic game as the first egg-like game, but in actuality, according to the egg-like wiki, LSD Dream Emulator was the first egg-like. The fantastic game is probably the most well-known egg-like and was the first game that perfectly fitted the description of an egg-like. The game mentioned on the iceberg is Le Fantabulous, another well-known egg-like that is also known as the quest for sausage. The game isn't anything special, just a standard Unity walking simulator, but yeah, it is quite surreal. Bat Castle. Bat Castle is yet another RPG maker game where you play as this guy, maybe he's the bat, and you walk around a castle. Maybe Bat Castle? I played a bit of it and it's really not that good. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but when you walk around your character's sprite mirrors itself. Back in the day I used to mess around with Unity a lot, and um, I'm pretty sure that that like takes one line of code to fix. The sound design is not bad and the music is pretty interesting. I literally couldn't get past the first enemy in the game, this purple ghost guy. Looking online I was told to drink the ghost potion before fighting him, but for some reason my guy couldn't even open the potion to drink it, so I wasn't really able to experience everything that the bat castle had to offer. Goblet Grotto. I swear that 90% of the games on this iceberg have been played on stream by Vice Horse Vinny. Like, when searching any game on this iceberg on Google, the first suggestion would be a Twitch stream of Vinny playing the said game. I don't know, maybe the creator of the iceberg just really lacks Vine Souls? Goblet Grotto takes Cryptoworld's place as being the best game on this iceberg so far. This game is a masterpiece. I have no idea why I haven't played this before. I like to think that if I was going to make a game, it could be as good as this. In Goblet Grotto, you play as a frog knight guy that explores the grotto in search for goblets. While the concept is pretty simple, the game has tons of content. There's heaps of hidden areas, people to interact with, different enemies. The game is just overall really great. For some reason while playing, the, these symbols kept popping up at the top of my screen and ear raping me. I'm not too sure what that was all about. Also, the frog guy is pretty cool. He uh, he makes noises every time you do stuff. 
Funny Pizza Land. Funny Pizza Land is uh, quite the disturbing game. Playing this shit has kept me up at night and I, I really wish I didn't learn about this game. Funny Pizza Land is described as a playable painting and I gotta say, who the f paints like this? When you wanted to make a playable painting, what f***ing painting were you trying to make paintable? Actually no, I don't think I want to know that. <laughs> Look at this shit. Yeah, that's, that's surreal. Do I really need to say more? The game's not bad, and I can say the effort was put into it, unlike a lot of these entries. The game was a bit of a bitch to run, but I can't really blame it because it is from 2002. Also, there is a second Funny Pizza Land game, and it doesn't look like the inside of a homeless man's butthole. The art style is actually pretty decent. Magic Dweedoo's games. Magic Dweedoo has quite the large list of surreal games, and looking on his website, I'm getting very intrigued to play each one just to punish myself. Of course, I'm not gonna do that though, because I do have my limits. I like how Brainworms, the iceberg creator, just described this entry as absurd games. I feel that fits perfectly. The one game of his that I did play was called The True Western Romance. I mean, just look at that thumbnail, how could I not play it? I was also tempted to play this game named Pube, but it didn't look worthy enough. After 5 minutes of playing The True Western Romance, my life had changed. I had never experienced such a gut-wrenching story. The way I play games from now on will forever be changed. Now you better scoot on before I get Johnny Longwood onto your ass to tear you apart into parts from head to toe, got it? Go on, scram! What are you saying? Talk louder, kid! What? I really gotta revisit this guy's games. They look amazing and I could honestly make a whole video about this rabbit hole. This is one of those entries I talked about back in tier 1 where I said just searching the name of an entry can take you into a rabbit hole and like show you a bunch of surreal games that you never knew existed. Like the game I played said it only had 800 plays, which uh, damn I feel like I feel like a pioneer. Blomko's games. God, this tier is just packed with bangers, isn't it? Blomko is another guy that makes a real game, and they're honestly on par with the ones I just mentioned. Going onto Blomko's itch.io page, we're greeted with the description, Hello, here are a few games. I will make more games. Thank you for being here. Aww. The two games of his that I did play were Herm's Odyssey because of the thumbnail and Burger World because I'm a morbidly obese 40 year old that loves burgers. In Herm's Odyssey, we become Herm and go on an odyssey. Something that I have always wanted to do. Cool, that's, that's one thing off my bucket list. Move aside, Goldberg Grotto, because I just found the new best surreal game. I gotta warn you before I go further, because the story of Herm's Odyssey is... It's very emotional. After the death of your blob buddy, Herm decides to avenge his mate and visit a great wizard. I cannot believe this. How could I have been so foolish? I must visit a great wizard and avenge his death. Herm makes his way to his spaceship after leaving the... Ch chunch? What the fuck is that? Also... What, what is that? After we get to the spaceship, Herm presses the big button to begin his journey. While we're traveling at warp speed, we're able to eat, drink, and sleep. After taking a power nap, we get to the first destination, McDonald's. Sorry, I, I meant to say the intergalactic embassy of burgers. After going inside, oh shit, it's the guy from Smiling Friends, we see a massive lion. So while we wait for it to die down a bit, we go take a piss. Going in the bathroom, we see... Oh f that, that's not a urinal. Yes, Herm, this is impossible. How do I piss in this room? After going back in the line, some guy's burger decides to combust, blowing away all of the customers. Cool, no more line. After erting a burger, we go back to our ship and go to the next destination. After opening the ship's hatch, we see, um... Bart Simpson buff skeleton in Adidas shorts smoking a cigarette. You know, just your normal Wednesday afternoon. Apparently he's here to kill Herm, but <laughs> did you actually think that would work? Herm absolutely obliterates evil man into space and goes back to his ship to continue his odyssey. Going to our next destination, we reach a asteroid belt? Uh oh. After dodging some asteroids in a bullet hell sequence, Herm eventually crashes his ship into a giant rock hurtling towards him. After what looks like a drunk driving accident, we wake up in space prison. Only the guards are literal blobs and can't do anything about us escaping. Walking up to some other inmates, we see a green guy that says he can't leave. 
no arms. After hijacking this humanoid spaceship, Herm continues his odyssey until, oh, a black hole. After getting sucked into the black hole, we end up in the tube dimension. Everything's cool though, because this is where Herm was trying to go. In the tube dimension, we find that wizard that Herm was looking for. After killing Herm with lightning, he flies to heaven, being reunited with his dead friend. God, this game is so epic! The other Blomco game I played was Burger World. It's Burger Day, so we better be ready to make some burgs. We gotta feed every customer, and then we'll be free. We gotta make sure we make each burg the way they want. Yada yada yada, it's, it's, it's Papa's Burgeria, but in space, yeah, cool, I think I got it. Alright, so we get the option to gather some ingredients before we serve the burgs. Each ingredient you gather is like its own little mini game, and they're pretty fun. Alright, so this grey tumor wants one cheese, three blood, six meat, and seven egg. Oh, cool, I've already forgotten what he wants, so just have to get what I give him. Oh, he, he didn't like it. Alright, uh, what does the next guy want? One cheese, six blood, seven meat, seven egg. Alright, I think I can remember that. Alright, cool, here we go. Alright, that, that's, that's enough of Burger World. The Museum of Everything Goes. The Museum of Everything Goes is an obscure edutainment CD-ROM project from 95 that was mostly forgotten about. The game is pretty interesting, to say the least. You play through a first-person perspective walking around a museum, clicking on different paintings and statues to enter these pretty surreal but basic mini-games. I didn't get too far into it because, you know, I would prefer not to have a brain aneurysm. Don't go in there. Look what happened to me. Cool, I guess I'm going in then. Actually, never mind. Do I have to? Alright, what, what happens if I click this painting? Ah, cool, a, a gardening simulator. Alright, what, what else is there? Um, alright, that's, that's cool, I guess. What, what else? What do you want? What do you want? What, what do you want? T to stop playing this game? Go Home. Go Home is a third-person horror game from 2009. It's set in a residential area in early 2000s Japan. You play as a little girl with a blurred face named Mosaiko Suzuki, who's been separated from her parents and is trying to get home. Unfortunately for her, death is merely seconds away at any given moment, as strange monsters pop out of every nook and cranny, and seemingly every turn leads to danger. You know, it's just your normal day in Ohio. Ohio. While it can be somewhat comedic at times, the game is definitely disturbing more than anything. I got the description of the game from a wiki page because while playing it I had absolutely no idea what was happening. It's pretty interesting. Apparently the game was made by a Japanese VTuber called Irimatu Ichimatsu. Milk inside a bag of milk inside a bag of milk. Alright, so apart from Hilux 2 coming up, this is the last game on the iceberg that I've played prior to making this video. As we get deeper, I'll be experiencing all of these games for the first time, so forgive me if my descriptions aren't very good. This game is pretty well known, and I'm not too sure why it's down here with all this other stuff, but oh well. I got this game a bit after it came out, cause the art style looked really cool, and well, it only cost a dollar, so. For its price, I was shocked at how good it is. The game focuses around a girl with mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, or all of the above. The way the game tells its story is really unique, and it's able to make you feel like her mental illness is your own. This game kind of hit a bit close to home. It really outlines how hard it can be to complete simple tasks without overthinking them and getting things done. <clears throat> kind of like my YouTube channel. I won't spoil anything because I definitely recommend you play it. It literally costs a dollar on Steam. Insert coin maze. <sighs> I spent way too long trying to beat this game. Insert coin is a maze game where you control a cube in a maze. Yep, that's it. There's wrong turns you can take and obstacles that will end your game and force you to refresh the page if you want to keep playing. For some reason, after beating a level, I was able to glitch my way out of the maze. Maybe that had something to do with beating the game? I don't know, I wasn't able to beat it. I couldn't really find a guide for it either, so I, I kinda just gave up. You are my home. This game is a bit disturbing, to say the least. 
The game's plot revolves around a game cartridge that you find at your front door. You put it in your game console, cause why wouldn't you, and you're greeted by an anime girl. After some pretty personal questions, some very creepy mini games, and some one to one discussion, the anime girl asks you if you're home. After saying yes, she asks you to go outside your house and look for her. Because I have an IQ of 10, I did so. After clicking on the prompt confirming I did in fact look for her, she says that, that that's the first time I've looked for her, which I mean, is correct, yes, and that she has nothing else to show me. The game has a bunch of connotations towards like stalking people and entering their home, so a bit hard to explain, but I really like the interpretation of the story by many a badass hero. But it looks like this is a actual physical entity. This is not like, oh, it's a ghost possessing a cartridge. I'm going to assume, here's how, how the plot works. We have a stalker. The stalker is stalking a baby. This stuff, type of stuff has happened in real life before. This is a real thing that's happened to people. Stalking a baby is obsessed with them. It's going to abduct them. It's been coming in their house. Has been like doing all sorts of weird stuff throughout their life. You get video footage that they've recorded over the years and somehow they've squeezed it into a game cartridge. Uh, that's one hell of a cartridge. And they've chronicled all the way from when you were a baby up till you're a little kid. I'm assuming you're now an adult or a teenager, or at least someone older and more independent. And they've dropped this thing off to you as a way of like revealing the crime, but in like a loving way. Like, like look at all the things. Look how dedicated I am to you. Shao Mythos. The Shao Mythos. I hope that's how you say it. Also known as the John Defoe Tetraology or the Tribly Tetriology are a series of horror themed freeware adventure games by Ben Yatsu Croshaw. First released in 2003, the first game follows a gentleman thief named Trilby as he tries to burgle an old country manor, only to end up trapped inside with a bunch of other people and a lurking homicidal being. The following games jump around in space and time, though Trilby does show up again, but they all end having some link to the secret of Defoe Manor. The four games are in order of creation, five days a stranger, seven days a skeptic, Trilby's notes, and six days a sacrifice. These games are alright, I guess. I played a bit of the first one and it wasn't really my thing to be honest, but they are definitely surreal. Space Kids. I'm so sad I couldn't find a way to play this. Space Kids is an MS-DOS game from 1994. It's a collection of mini-games and plays somewhat similar to WarioWare, but without the time limit. Depending on the actions taken in-game, the player can discover multiple branching paths leading to different endings. For example, in one early mini-game, the main characters slide their way down the spaceship's runway and can either land safely at the bottom or fall off, landing in a bag carried by a pirate. Just by looking at this game's art style, you can probably guess why it's on this iceberg. Just look at this mood and guy. 50 Short Games 50 Short Games is a collection of 50 short games made by the Catamites, the people or person, I don't know, that made Goblet Grotto and Space Funeral and a bunch of other games on this iceberg. I can't believe I spent money on this game. Thanks for your help, Patreons, for letting me afford this, this game. 50 Short Games is just what it sounds like. A collection of 50 short and sweet hand-drawn games. Honestly, most of them aren't bad, even though a few of them are unplayable. The person that makes these games are definitely creative. I guess you could say. Cookies. This is our first entry on the iceberg that has a content warning, so yeah, we're finally getting into those games. The content warning by the creator of the iceberg is for drugs, gore, NSFW stuff, and imagery of, um, you know, those, those guys that used to worship that one guy that looked like Charlie Chaplin, and they had that symbol of, like, the, the Buddhist symbol on, like, a red flag, and, like, they fought in World War II and stuff. This game is crazy good. I don't know why I haven't heard of it. Cookies follows five different short stories, presented in the form of a VHS-styled PS1 game. Playing Cookies, it's really clear that it takes a bunch of inspiration from classic horror titles, such as Candyman and Twin Peaks. The game covers everything from gang violence to drug abuse and all that nice stuff. It has a bunch of satanic cult imagery, and it's done pretty well. I definitely recommend Cookies. I mean, it literally costs nothing to play. Just um, don't, don't forget about that content warning. Pansylvania slash Gigglebone Gang Games The Gigglebone Gang Games are a series of edutainment CD-ROM games from the mid-90s. The first game in the series was the Gigglebone Gang Pansylvania. These games are just your standard edutainment games from the 90s, except for one thing, surrealism. These games are just plain weird. 
I have no idea how someone playing this as a kid was meant to learn anything from it. If anything, it just makes my head hurt. Damn, I've, I've been saying that a lot lately, haven't I? And this is only tier 3. Serial Experiments Lane. Serial Experiments Lane is a game made for the PS1 back in 98, based on the anime from the same name. If you've seen the anime, you can probably tell why this game is on the iceberg. The game is super weird. While I haven't seen the anime, I briefly know what it's about. From what I hear, the game is an adaptation and it takes place in its own canon from the anime. The game's pretty unique. It's presented in a way that kind of feels similar to analog horror. Like, you, you constantly flash images and showing different footage and, and stuff to piece the story together. It looks pretty interesting, but I, I might watch the series before I play it. My Toza. My Toza is a fun little game. I think the name is a play on words of mitosis because life, biology, and uh, evolution and stuff. I don't know, I dropped out of biology class after the first year. In my toes, though, you're confronted with a seed in a dark room. Oh my god, no way. You're able to transform the seed into different things by choosing two different options. From there, you make more choices, trying not to get sent back to the start, and you end up with some uh, surreal imagery, I guess you could call it. I didn't beat the game because, well, I'm a dumbass. The game has a really cool Adobe Flash player style that's pretty nostalgic. Brings me back to the Newgrounds days. I mean, apparently it's from 2011 and was ported onto Steam just recently, so yeah. If you want to play it, go do it. It's it's free. End Roll. End Roll is an RPG maker horror game from 2016 that was made by the developer Segwa. This game got to me a bit after I realized what it was about and made it a bit hard to get through. If you haven't played End Roll, I definitely recommend you do so, because I'm about to spoil most of the plot. And the game is definitely best played by going in blind. So yeah, that's my one warning. In Enroll, you play as a 14 year old named Russell as he goes on a journey of self-discovery in the world of his dreams. By playing through his dreams, you eventually find out that Russell murdered both of his parents and a zookeeper, resulting in him being sent to rehabilitation. We find out that he was originally given the death penalty for his crimes, but instead he was used as a test subject for a drug called Happy Dream. The purpose of this drug is to reform criminals and make them feel guilt for their actions by reliving their crimes in a sort of dream sequence. When you play as Russell, it becomes clear that the boy is emotionless and isn't capable of feeling guilt and remorse for his actions, let alone even understanding what the feelings of guilt and remorse are. Russell only has seven days to complete the task that he was challenged with, and if he succeeds, he'll be spared the death penalty and walk out of jail a free boy. Of course, if he fails, he'll die. Not that he really cares one way or another. It's all the same to him, life or death, it's miserable either way. And Roll kinda comes across as a bait and switch, kinda in a similar fashion to games such as Doki Doki Literature Club. If you go into this game blind, you might think it's just another upbeat RPG maker game, but as you make your way through the story, it becomes clear what the plot is actually about. Four Winds Fantasy Four Winds Fantasy is an indie game from 2001 that was first released on Xbox Live. Looking at this game, Game, it's hard to tell whether it's just a shit post or it's actually a genuine masterpiece. But once you play it, it's easy to get past the MS Paint graphics and appreciate the game for what it is. Amazing. To be 100% honest, I had no clue what was happening in this game when I played it, but despite the confusion, I still enjoyed the time I put into it. Definitely the best aspect of the game is the music. I mean, just listen to it, it's life changing to say the least. Despite how epic this game was, I think it made me develop a migraine. I'm not even kidding, I'm, I'm not trying to be quirky and funny, this game literally made my brain feel unhealthy. I feel like this game put my brain cell count into the negatives. Strange Telephone This game is so cool. Strange Telephone is a game from 2016 that was originally a mobile game but was later added to Steam with more content. While a lot of games on this iceberg could be described as inspired by Yume Nikki, the game from Tier 1, I feel like the inspiration for this game is quite apparent. It's definitely inspired by Yume Nikki. The game revolves around a telephone. A strange telephone. You're able to enter any number up to six digits into the telephone, which will give you a set of rooms you can explore within a set time limit. After you run out of time, the game ends and you're sent back to the start of the game with any items that you found along the way. 
While it may look like one, Strange Telephone isn't much of a walking simulator and more of a puzzle game. To progress through the game, you are encouraged to put in numbers that you find into your telephone to be transported to new areas. In these new areas, you can find items that you can use to open up even more areas to find even more items. The game has more than enough areas to explore that it kind of makes you feel like this game is procedurally generated even though it's not. The game doesn't really have much of a story, but it doesn't really need one. The one goal that the game gives you is to open this giant locked door that sits in the hub room. Once you're eventually able to open it, you'll see one of the 11 endings the game has to offer. Overall, it's a really neat little indie game. The developer of the game has another game coming out called Super Meteor, and it's kind of in the same sort of art style. I'm really looking forward to seeing what other games this developer is going to make. Of the Killer series, these games rock, man. This entry on the iceberg refers to the game series created by Garment District. All the games in the series are named Blank of the Killer, so that's why it's called the Of the Killer series. In these games, you play as a journalist or detective, I couldn't really tell, named BB, as she explores the bizarre and surreal world she lives in while documenting the oddities that she stumbles across for her magazine. These games kind of play like a mix between a walking simulator and a visual novel. The game has a really good atmosphere that somewhat reminds me of those liminal space photos. The art style of these games is also really neat. It uses MS Paint drawings in a 3D space and it's just so cool and unique looking. While it's kind of bizarre and confusing at times, all these games are really well written and have a pretty good sense of humor. For example, in the game called Drool of the killer. You go on a mysterious bus that takes you to a water park named Tammy. Turns out the water park is haunted and the name of the water park comes from the owner Tammy that drowned to death. While you explore the water park, you get haunted by the ghost of Tammy that constantly tries to drown you. At the end of the game, you walk into a janitor closet and the main character BB realizes that the pool she has been swimming in the whole time wasn't chlorinated. So she gets mad over the fact that she could have gotten chlamydia or a brain disease from the pool and she goes sicko mode and kills the water ghost. Yeah, these these games are pretty cool. Barkley Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. I don't know why this is so far down. Barkley Shut Up and Jam Gaiden is the unofficial sequel to the 1993 Barkley Shut Up and Jam, a basketball game for the Genesis. Unlike its official predecessor, 2008's Barkley Gaiden is in the form of a JRPG. The game follows basketball player Charles Barkley in the year 2041 in a post-apocalyptic Neo New York. Charles Barkley accidentally performs a powerful chaos dunk at the bar basketball game, inadvertently killing most of the people in attendance, you know, as one does. As a result, basketball is outlawed, and many basketball players are hunted down and killed. In 2053, another chaos dunk is performed in Manhattan, killing millions. Barkley is blamed for the chaos dunk, and is hunted down by the b-ball removal department, led by the one and only Michael Jordan. From there on, the plot just gets more insane. This game's pretty well known compared to other entries on the tier, so I'm pretty shocked it's this far down. Puss. Puss is another pretty well-known game that's really far down for some reason. Puss is a psychedelic horror puzzle game developed and published by Team Coil in 2018. Puss follows a small orange cat as it travels through various puzzles in 10 levels. If the player accidentally touches the edges of the map, the screen will glitch. If it glitches for too long, the cat will lose one life and will have to restart. This game is essentially just the maze game, but with a vaporwave aesthetic. Dead of the Brain. Dead of the Brain is a horror-based point-and-click game created back in 1992. It's a shame I couldn't get this game to run, because it does look really cool and I was pretty pumped to play it, but after I downloaded it, I realized that you had to have an emulator to play it, and uh, I couldn't really get that to work. This game was made for the PC-98, a Japanese home computer manufactured back in the late 90s. These computers actually had quite a lot of exclusive games that could only be played on the PC-98 or on an emulator. Looking on the iceberg, there's actually a few other games for the PC-98, so um, I don't know how I'm going to play them. Anyway, uh, enough about old computers. Dead of the Brain follows a guy named Cole that after doing some experiments with a guy named Dr. Hamilton, they accidentally use that green liquid stuff from the reanimator and begin a zombie outbreak on their city. That's the best description of the game I could get from watching gameplay videos on YouTube. Kitty Horror Show Games This entry on the iceberg refers to the surreal games created by the indie developer Kitty Horror Show. Their game games are pretty cool and unique and I definitely recommend checking out their itch.io page. She's most known for her Haunted Cities series. It's a set of games that contain a collection of 
these little short games. They're all pretty unique and different from each other, and they're, they're pretty cool. Like a lot of the other entries on this iceberg, her games are a lot more spooky than they are surreal. Alice is Dead Alice is Dead is a Newgrounds game from 2009, developed by the Newgrounds users Impending Riot and Hitosis. If you were around back in the 2012 days of YouTube, there's a good chance you would probably heard of this game. Alice is Dead is a point and click horror game based off the Alice in Wonderland property. Considering how Alice is in the free domain, there's a few entries on this iceberg that are based off it, with American McGee's Alice back in tier 1 being one of them. Alice is Dead is a spooky spin on the original story in which you wake up in a hole and see that Alice is dead. The point of the game is to figure out who you are and how you got there and how to escape. Due to the game's popularity, mainly from Let's players on YouTube. Several additions were made to the game, expanding on its lore. This series has some pretty deep lore. The creators have actually announced that they're remaking the trilogy in HD on Steam, and if their remake is successful, they'll be able to create an entirely new game that continues the story. It would be pretty cool if it got made. It was pretty nostalgic coming back to this game, and I'm, I'm glad to see that the creators never forgot about it. Tongue of the Fat Man. Tongue of the Fat Man, also known as Mondu's Fight Palace, is a 1989 fighting game developed by Activision for the Genesis, Commodore 64, and MS-DOS. This game is fucking insane, I mean just look at this guy. The game's pretty unique compared to other fighting games, not just graphic wise, but also gameplay wise. Unlike other fighting games, Tongue of the Fat Man has a currency system where you can bet on fights in the game and earn money to spend on items that you can take into battle. This game is honestly really solid and underrated, but due to its bizarre nature, many game journalists put the game's art before the gameplay and give it a bad rating. When Tongue of the Fat Man was released, it was pretty well received, but in recent years, it's come under a bunch of criticism. According to PC Gamer, Tongue of the Fat Man is ranked as one of the worst games of all time, which when comparing it to other games on this iceberg, that is pretty far from the truth. Hylix 2, baby! I know I say this a lot, but this game is one of, if not the best game I have ever played. This game is such a hidden gem, it's it's so shocking to me that a lot of people I talk to haven't even heard of it. I really want to make a video about the Hylix games, because they're really special to me, and I could talk about them for hours, but for now I'll just give you a quick description so this video isn't 3 hours long. I feel like the Hylix games are the perfect examples in proving that video games are art. Much like the first game, Hylix 2 uses a beautiful mix of claymation and 3D scanning to make one of the best art styles I have ever scene in a game. The graphics in this game are a lot more three-dimensional than the first game, with the game allowing you to traverse in a more non-linear space with platforms and the like. Not only does this game look and play great, but it sounds great too. The music for this game feels like it could have come from a 90s indie rock band, but you know, in a good way. Every track in this game is a certified banger. Just like the first game, Hylix 2 plays like a JRPG, but the combat and gameplay is a lot more in-depth than your usual RPG maker game. The story in Hylix isn't really the main focus, and while it has one, it's just used as a means of allowing you to explore the game's surreal world and meet new characters. I could keep going on about this game, but I honestly think it's best if you experience it for yourself. Just go play it. Red Tape Red Tape is yet another PS1 styled horror game developed by Polaris Studios in 2021. The game is more funny than it is surreal. The game's plot revolves around you making your way through a corporate office in hell named Hell Inc. while getting signatures and approval to make your way to the next level of hell to meet the devil. I wasn't paying much attention at the beginning and I thought I was like getting these documents signed so I could get approval to enter hell because like maybe I died or something. But the ending is not what I expected. After getting the devil's son to sign your document, it turns out you're the representative of an oil company and have come to meet the devil to buy hell so you can mine its oil reserves. After the devil's son signs the contract without looking, Mega Oil Co. buys hell and demolishes all of the buildings so that they can mine the oil, which ends up putting all of the demons working at Hell Inc. out of a job. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't really... I wasn't really expecting that. Life Tastes Like Cardboard Life Tastes Like Cardboard is a pretty unique walking simulator, developed by Demenza in 2019. This game is so much better than it looks. Going onto the game's Steam page, I was really put off by the lackluster description and the shoddy looking screenshots, but once I loaded up the game and became immersed in the story, I could not stop playing. 
In Life Tastes Like Cardboard, you play as a guy named John as he copes with self-pity and the boredom of everyday life. You control John as he has a lucid dream, reliving events from his past while he makes his way through a surreal dream space. This game is really relatable and if you're watching this video, you could probably relate to it too. Just the repetitiveness of each day, going to school, coming home and playing games, going to sleep, waking up to go to school and just repeating the same task every day. Just like for the main character in the game, lucid dreaming and just dreaming in general is a nice way to get away from life. If you think you can relate to this, I definitely recommend checking it out. A Date in the Park A Date in the Park is a Brazilian FMV point and click adventure game from 2014, developed by Cloak and Dagger Games. In A Date in the Park, you go on a date in a park. You play as a British guy named Lou, living in Brazil when he meets a lady at a bar who wants to go on a date in the park. After wandering around the park for a bit, adopting an injured duckling and thinking you've been stood up, you go to the meeting spot of the date and find a box sitting on the bench. The box is from your date and she wants to play a game to see if you can find her. After answering a bunch of her riddles, you stumble across another one of her boxes. After opening the box, you find a, a, a severed head. Yeah, it, it turns out your date is a serial killer. After going back to the entrance of the park, you find the body belonging to the head in the box. Understandably, the police have been called and have just arrived. A policeman shouts demands at Lou, but considering he can't speak Portuguese, he just willingly puts his hands up. After the baby duckling from earlier bites him, he reaches his hand into his jacket and gets shot by the policeman. Oh, sh oh shit, look, look behind you, dude. Damn, I guess that was, um, a date. A Date in the Park, Tetrageddon. Tetrageddon, also called Tetrageddon Games, is more of a website than it is a game. Going onto the game's itch.io page and downloading the game brings you to tetrageddon.com. This website is quite the rabbit hole, to say the least. By clicking on different things, you get sent to more web pages where you can click on even more things and go to even more web pages to click on even more stuff. The game, or should I say website, kept trying to download audio files to my computer over and over again, which was a bit of Annoying. The game is uh, it's quite interesting, just don't visit it if you have epilepsy. No. That's probably not a good idea. This is Infinity. This is Infinity is a really abstract game from 2009, created for the Ludum Dare 16. I didn't know before researching this that the Ludum Dare was that old. If you don't know what the Ludum Dare is, it's basically a game jam that lets anyone participate. According to the creator, This is Infinity is about exploring rules, graphics, goals, behavior, and interaction. In the creator's bio on cactusquid.com, he says a lot of the games on his site are just small experiments dressed up as games, and uh, yeah, this is definitely one of them. I played it for about 5 minutes or so, and had to stop to prevent myself from having a stroke. There seems to be a lot of games on this iceberg that are aiming to give me an epileptic attack. Ivan Zanotti's Games This entry on the iceberg refers to the games created by Ivan Zanotti on Game Jolt. One of his games was mentioned on this iceberg already, called I'm Scared. It was on Tier 2, I think. Most of the games he makes are quite similar to I'm scared in the sense that they're very surreal and a, a bit spooky. Ivan's pretty well known in the community as he's very open to answering questions and, and talking to fans about the games he makes. He's a pretty cool dude and you should definitely check out his game job page if you like surreal games and you like shitting yourself. Suits Absolute Power Suits Absolute Power is the sequel to the game back in tier 2. Suits a business RPG. Like the first game, it's a turn-based RPG with a unique hand-drawn style. Also like the first game, this title definitely needs a lot more attention driven to it. When researching the game before I played it, I was honestly shocked to see the lack of people that have covered it. Every second of this game is more memorable than the last. After beating Absolute Power, I'm pretty surprised that this game isn't more popular. This game is the perfect example of what a sequel should be. It expands on the first game on such an extreme level. The story is way more compelling and in-depth than the first, and the writing is insanely good. Also, the music is so good, it's worth buying the game just to listen to it. Suits is by far one of my favourite indie game series, and it really deserves a lot more recognition. I'm not gonna talk about the plot or anything, just go, go play it, play it please. Happy World Happy World is a surreal adventure game from 2018 created by JMass. In Happy World, you play as this blue disc thing and you roll around restoring happiness to people that are infested with negative energy. The game's art and music is really neat, kind of reminding me of Katamari Damacy somewhat. After a bit the game starts to get not so happy. 
and gets a bit spooky. And the sudden tone shift is pretty well done. After playing the games on the iceberg, I'm kind of getting sick of games that look like they're super fun and upbeat and happy. And then after I play the game for like 10 minutes, I realize that it's a horror game and I end up shitting myself. You know, it, it'd be nice to play a happy game for once. Happy game. Oh God, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Finally, a happy game I can play to get my mind off these pieces of nightmare fuel. God fucking damn it, fucking hate this iceberg. Can I please just get a break? Jesus Christ. Happy Game is a horror adventure game developed by Amanita Design in 2021. The plot follows a little kid as he falls asleep to a horrific nightmare. The objective of the game is to make your way through these nightmares by completing these pretty unique puzzles as a means of making the boy happy again. The game has some pretty cool art and each puzzle in the game is super unique and satisfying to complete. Just don't know why it's so far down though, it's it's pretty well known. Trio the Punch. Trio the Punch is an arcade game created by Data East back in 1990 and was then re-released in 2007 as a part of a collection of arcade games for the PS2. Trio the Punch plays like a beat-em-up where you're able to choose from three playable characters, hence the name Trio the Punch. While the game looks like a pretty standard beat-em-up where you scroll from left to right beating up a bunch of guys, this game is pretty unique. The company Data East did a thing back in the late 80s and 90s where they would go through a bunch of their old games and parody them. This game does not take itself seriously at all, which is honestly a breath of fresh air when you play an arcade beat em up. Gabal Screen Gabor Screen is a 1996 PS1 game created by the music label Antino's Records. Yep, this is a PS1 game created by a Japanese record label on the surreal game iceberg. I didn't think I'd ever have to say that sentence. While looking at the gameplay of this game, you wouldn't be mistaken if you thought it was LSD Dream Emulator. These games share some striking similarities, but then again, I guess every surreal PS1 game kind of looks like this. The game is hosted by and I didn't know this before researching, Tetsuya Komuro. If you're into Japanese pop or Japanese music in general, it's pretty likely that you've at least heard of this guy. He used to be a pretty successful songwriter and music producer back in the day, and is widely regarded to be one of the most influential figures in pop throughout the 1990s. I, I can't believe he, 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 hosted, he hosted the game. Anyway. The ball screen is a surreal adventure game hosted by Tetsuya Komuro in which the player can travel around different places using a flying shoe and in each place they go they can interact with objects and people to gain all the CDs of that place. After you collect a set of CDs, the correlating song will be able to be played back in the hub area. It's honestly a pretty cool game and I'm quite shocked I've never heard of it. The tomatoes are okay. The Tomatoes Are Okay is a horror game created by Dan Sanderson in 2017. I couldn't really tell what was happening in the game because of this obnoxious VHS filter, but I'll do my best to describe it. You start out on a farm and go check if your tomatoes are okay. After getting a trophy and getting a pig, we walk into the store and get sent into the back rooms. After clicking a bunch of buttons and dimension hopping, we end up being chased by a stick figure thing. After getting jump scared a bunch by the stick figure thing, the game ends. Um, cool. Next game, Murder Dog 4. This game is so epic. It's another entry on the iceberg made by my favorite surreal game developer, the Catamites. Oh my god, they, they get, their games are just so epic. I'm gonna be using some footage from YouTube from this guy, because when, when I tried to play it, it looked like this. For some reason, Murder Dog 4 follows the trial of the century, the trial of the murder dog. Murder Dog is on the trial for crimes against humanity. He murdered some people, or something, I don't know, I wasn't able to play it. The Astonishing Captain Skull. This is another game made by the Catamites, so yeah, it's also pretty epic. I love their games so much, they, they just make a bunch of claymation animations and they, they put them into a venture game studio and make a game out of them, it's, it's so cool. This is the second game in the Captain Skull series. The first one didn't make the iceberg, unfortunately. The game follows Captain Skull and his friend Quimby, or something, as they go to a space bunker to investigate a murder by a ghost. If the gameplay you're seeing now looks cool, go play it, but if not, that's okay. While the choppiness in these games can be charming, it's obviously not for everyone. Mouth Sweet. Mouth Sweet is an RPG Maker game developed by Love Games in 2016. 
This is one of the better RPG Maker games I've played. Both the cool graphics and unique battle system make it hard to tell that this game was even made in RPG Maker. In Mouth Suite, you play as Hass, a new hire to the company, CC, and C. The bulk of the game focuses around you completing mundane tasks around the office while shooting invisible ghost men in the hallways. The message of this game hits pretty hard and it's one that I think a lot of people can relate to. The game perfectly encapsulates what it's like to work in a toxic environment and be abused by the higher ups in the office. Like, it's, it's kind of scary how accurate this game is, you know, beside the shooting and invisible people in the hallways with revolver and all the head exploding stuff. Swallow the Sea Swallow the Sea is a pretty cool game made by It's the Talia in 2020. In Swallow the Sea, you play as this little fish egg embryo thing on the ocean floor and your goal is to eat other egg things so that you can get bigger and reach the next area. It plays a lot like that game Tasty Planet. If, if you've played it then you'll know exactly what I mean. After getting to a certain size, the embryo breaks out of this egg and the screen goes black. Afterwards we see a conveyor belt littered with dead fish and stuff. Turns out the whole time you were inside of a dead sea creature on the conveyor belt in some fish factory you weren't in the ocean. The ending's kinda sad, right? as soon as this little orange guy gets out of his egg, he gets squashed by a hydraulic press. Rekinder. Rekinder is a remake of the 2003 RPG Maker game, Kinder, made by Horofuki Yoko Chow. The game isn't anything special, it's just your average Japanese spooky shock RPG Maker game. Despite it being a remake, it still looks like it was made with clip art from Microsoft PowerPoint, and the translation is not quite there. Don't get me wrong, it's definitely not the worst RPG Maker game I've played, but it's definitely up there. In Rekindle, you play as a third grader named Shinuki that's just returned to his hometown after staying at his grandma's house. But the town is not the same as it was when he left. It's now a ruined town of death. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Skin Crawlers. Skin Crawlers is a horror game made in 2020 by Leaky Fingers for the Haunted Hunting Jam, a game jam where developers would make a horror game based around the theme of hunting. In Skin Crawlers, you play as a TV spider thing in an endless web covered void. The goal is to collect five different TV channel signals by hunting down other TVs with signals. While there's not much to it, it's still a fun little game that was made in a month for a game jam. It's pretty fun and interesting. There's so many questions. Questions like why is this man on the TV yelling? Why why is my TV spitting out webs? And why why does it have spider legs? We may never know. No love. No love is an RPG made by Wallace Lovecraft in 2019. For some reason, when I bought the game on itch.io, I got it for three bucks. But when I checked it a few days later, it increased to 17 bucks. I don't know. Maybe maybe it was on sale or something. Probably, uh, I don't really pay attention to that stuff. No Love is described as a hard sci-fi fantasy hand-drawn RPG with a unique original story that's mainly about the characters and it delves into topics regarding the human condition. Like a lot of RPGs on this iceberg, the best aspect of it is the story. This game is super interesting and the stories hooked me in and I couldn't stop playing it. The game consists of you exploring different areas, having a boss fight and watching a cutscene and then re repeating that. The characters in the game are written pretty well and it made sitting through all of the dialogue pretty fun. Also the art style is just really cool looking. Go, go, go check it out, it's a good game, go, go play it. Atoll, The Last Ghost. Atoll The Last Ghost is a short horror game made by Nikolay Shaludev for the 2021 Brackies Game Jam. This game is so more than I could have expected. While it's not long, it's still really good for what what the game has to offer. Atoll is a point and click game where you make your way through a few areas, picking up ghosts to join your team and discovering items. While exploring, you have to fight these evil spirits that get in your way. Once you clear out this abandoned lab place, you make your way to a destroyed city. It turns out that the world is overrun by evil spirits, and only you know how to stop them. You have the option of either continuing to fight the spirits, or sacrificing all the ghosts in your team to close the portal to the ghost world. Apparently, the game has six 
six different endings, but that's just the one I got. I don't know what it is about this game, but I, I really like it. Bowler. Bowler is a game about a guy with a hat and other stuff too. The guy that made this game was definitely partaking in black tar heroin when he made it. In Bowler, you play as this little green guy in a bowler hat. You're in this like fighting tournament or something where you gotta blow your opponent off the stage before they do. After blowing four different opponents, no, not, not, not like that. You end up talking to this top hat guy who sends you to a place called the warp and uh yeah uh, I, I don't i don't like it but but it's all cool though because this guy is gonna tell us how to leave Ah oh boy, Paradigm. Paradigm is a surreal adventure game created by Jacob Janurka in 2017. I think I remember watching PewDiePie play this back in the day, and I thought this game was pretty cool. In Paradigm, you play as a mutant named Paradigm, as you explore around a surreal post-apocalyptic Eastern European country. Paradigm is being cyberbullied by this genetically engineered sloth with a Donald Trump wig, and our goal is to stop the guy. That's uh pretty much the plot. I love the music in the game, it's it's really atmospheric and I, I don't know what it is but it kind of gives me a weird feeling. The game's pretty epic, I mean, you can say hello to every interactable object in the game, so very, very cool. Remember Places? Remember Places is a horror game from a 2020 game jam made by Bruce Butcher. In Remember Places, you are locked inside a room with a sign telling you not to leave with the only thing you can interact with being a computer. The only thing that's keeping your mind sane while being trapped is an AI inside your computer. The game is really cool for only being made in 4 days, and was honestly really interesting. A pretty cool concept. Crazy boss. I like how the creator of the iceberg says in the entry's description that this thing is the bare minimum of being a game, and after looking at some gameplay I completely agree with them. Crazy boss is an unlicensed in quotation marks game launched in 2004 for the Sega Genesis by Tom Cripps. In Crazy Boss, you can do things such as move forward, move backwards, and also, get this, honk the horn. If that's not in-depth gameplay, then I don't know what is. Why is this on the iceberg? It's not even a game. Get, get this shit out of here. Necro Passaria. Necro Passaria is a creepy point-and-click flash game series where you play as a guy named Johnny Boy and you explore the dark world of Necro Passaria. I played part one and it was quite confusing. I had to refuel my generator so I could watch TV. Also, my generator was a giant head. This game's art is pretty cool, I guess, but other than that, the, the game isn't anything too special. I'm so thankful thankful for the ruffle emulator. If it wasn't for the preservation of all of these flash games, a large portion of games on this iceberg would be playable. So um, yeah. Also, <laughs> cock. Carambola. Carambola is another point and click game made by Holy Pangolian in 2017. To be honest, I had no idea what was happening in this game, but I guess that's sort of my fault for having brain damage. Despite my confusion, this game is really great and I, I loved every second of it. The art is just mwah. The puzzles in this game are satisfying and are actually really challenging. I got stuck a bunch on some, but once I completed them it was just so satisfying. Lost. Lost is an RPG maker horror game made by Cest Redata in 2018. The game's plot is the following. After wandering aimlessly in a seemingly empty world, a young man finds a key laying abandoned on a path, as well as an arrangement of structures, all requiring a specific key to access them. Despite what's all there to explore and interact with, the keys are the main gateway to progress, and the flowers are optional prizes. I didn't play this game for long, but the, the atmosphere was really on point and the, the music was just oh, it really tickled that itch in my brain. Small Talk. Small Talk is an interactive exploration game made by Pale Room on itch.io. I couldn't find a download link for the game and when I go on the itch.io page it says it was published in 2017 but somehow is still in development. After clicking the sign me up button I was brought to an error 404 page. After looking at the screenshots and the trailer I, I gotta say this game looks pretty epic. The art and the 
animation just looks so great and I'm really pumped for when it comes out. The Sea Will Claim Everything The Sea Will Claim Everything is a point and click adventure game developed by Jonas Kriartes in 2016. Um, this game is okay I guess. I just don't really think the art style is for me, it, it kinda hurts my eyes. The plot of the game is pretty complex for what it is. It revolves around a portal or something being open to this world and um, it's called the Underhome and people are trying to save it or something, I don't know. According to the creator, the game is inspired by the Greek government debt crisis, so um... There's that. Vangers. This game is so good. Vangers is a game developed by KD Lab in 1998. Vangers is a mind altering sandbox game that can be described as a racing role playing adventure game with a very complicated storyline. The best way to explain this game is um, think of think of Mad Max, but with bug human hybrid people. The amount of lore and world building this game has to offer completely blew my mind. You could literally play this game for hundreds of hours and still have to go back and replay it to understand some stuff. Also the music and the atmosphere is just amazing. It reminds me a little bit of Hylix. Also the, the game's on Steam now so uh, yeah go go play it. Meat Shift. Meat Shift is a short horror game made by the Rat King Collective in 2020. Meat Shift is a narrative game that takes place in the grimy halls of a slaughterhouse and meat packaging facility. You play through a guide's first shift in the slaughterhouse. You start off cutting open pigs and grinding meat but but after a while things start to get a bit weird. After you try and unclog the meat grinder, your hands get stuck and you lose some of your fingers. Apparently that is against protocol for some reason, I'm not too sure why. And the manager lady is now hunting us down. After she puts us underneath the slaughterhouse, uh, the ending shows your character jumping into a meat grinder while a clone of yourself lines up behind you, showing that the game takes place in a never ending loop. I think maybe the game is like a critique of the meat industry or something. I'm, I'm not sure. The ending kind of confused me. It, it's, it's a pretty cool game though. Samaros 1. This entry refers to the first game in the Samaros series, a set of puzzle point and click adventure games created in Adobe Flash by Amanita Design. The first game, Samaros 1, was released in 2003, and two more sequels have since been made. This game is really weird looking, and it, it kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. There's something about the old Flash games that use real life photos as models, they just really creep me out for some reason. I, I don't know, it's probably just me. In Samaros, you play as a gnome that spots a planet moving towards his home planet. The gnome goes to the planet, and after exploring and seeing a bunch of surreal stuff, he finds the engine room and changes the planet's course so it narrowly misses his home planet. While I guess some people might like this sort of game, I kinda just hate this art style with a passion, and it really just creeps me out. It's more, it's more uncanny than than it is surreal. Nightmare, 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 nightmare. Nightmare is a surreal first person shooter created by the strangest IO in 2020. Nightmare is a dystopian FPS where you take control of a machine angel to incinerate hordes of synthetic demons. At first glance, Nightmare might just look like Doom, but with graphics that were made by a homeless man on black tie heroin. But after playing it, it's definitely more than that. I'm sorry if I keep using the word black tie heroin in these videos. I must have like an addiction or something. A an addiction to saying the word, not not an addiction to black tie heroin. I gotta stop saying that word or I'll get a strike on my channel. Anyway, Nightmare does what Cruelty Squad from Tier 2 tried to do. Be a good game. No, I'm just I'm just kidding. It, it wasn't that bad. Nightmare is essentially Quake Pro Tournament with roguelike elements and surreal 90s Japan inspired graphics. The game absolutely rocks and is one of the better games I've played on this tier. I I'm really glad I checked it out. The Tender Cut. This game, I think, refers to the game by No on Game Jolt. When I clicked on the link on the iceberg, it linked me to a unbought domain. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that this is the game that the iceberg creator was referring to. This is another game I remember from the YouTube Let's Play days. So when I saw the name on the iceberg, I instantly recognized it. This game really got to me, and I'll tell you why. I'm really 
desensitized to a lot of stuff like extreme gore and things like that so a lot of these games on the iceberg have been a breeze to play because well nothing can phase me anymore however i'm not able nor will i ever be able to deal with anything that has to do with eyes and uh this game is known for a certain scene where a uh, certain someone's eye is uh cut open yeah this this game really fucked me up i had to stop playing it or i literally would have had a brain aneurysm i got the ending with the eye and i stopped right there i didn't really want to continue david lynch teaches typing david lynch teaches typing is a 2018 typing game made by rhino stew in the game the famous filmmaker david lynch teaches typing that's that's about it number 12 my nuts one why are they so goddamn itchy? Nah, I'm, I'm, I'm joshing you man, this, this game is spooky. It's a pretty standard typing simulator until David Lynch tells you to put your left pinky on, on the bug nest next to your keyboard and then the game glitches and plays a minute long video of disturbing imagery. It's a it's a great game in my opinion. Time is solid here. This game is really sick. So you know those weird looking images you see on Twitter that are made by AI? <laughs> they, they sure are terrifying, right? Now, um, make a game out of art made by an AI. Je Jesus fucking Christ. This game is super neat. I, I just love the concept of wandering around an art gallery and interacting with weird looking AI people. Also the soundtrack, it's it's amazing. Just beautiful. Mwah. 10 out of 10. Milk outside a bag of milk outside a bag of milk. Milk outside a bag of milk outside a bag of milk is the sequel to the game mentioned earlier in the tier called Milk Inside a Bag of Milk Inside a Bag of Milk. I want to fucking kill myself. While the first game was really short and just showed the story of a very mentally ill girl struggling to buy some milk, the second game goes a lot more in depth into her character and is a lot longer. This game is such a good example of how to do a sequel to a game that doesn't have much content. The graphics are so much more detailed, the story is so much more in depth, and the writing along with the music are just perfect. I might have had a little bit of bias because I did play this game before I played the first one and I, I really enjoyed this one a lot more. This game has over 8,000 positive reviews on Steam for a reason. This game is really good. The game has a really accurate portrayal of mental illness and trauma and how it can affect someone's everyday life. The realism in this game kind of makes me question the developer of the game. Like either he's a psychiatrist or something or he's gone through some serious shit because the depiction of mental illness in this game is spot on. Even more so than the first game. Also, the, the game made me cry a little bit, so um, yeah, bo bonus points for that. Hypnagogia Boundless Dreams. Hypnagogia Boundless Dreams is a PS1 starred walking simulator developed by Soda Raptor in 2021. Hypnagogia is a solo developed exploration game that takes players on a journey through a series of mystifying dream sequences, each with their own unique theme and visual style. This game is super cool. While it's a lot like the other exploration games, on this iceberg, this one just hits different. The atmosphere and the music is just on point, and this game makes exploring areas feel less like a chore, and more like something you want to do, unlike a lot of other walking simulators I've covered so far. The main thing that sets this game apart from other walking simulators definitely has to be the well done puzzles, they're just so satisfying. Also, all of the hidden secrets and surprises you find in the game are just, they're great. In Boundless Dreams, you're not just walking around aimlessly through a real and bizarre world, you have well thought out objectives and take advantage of different playstyles and gimmicks. It's overall one of the better walking simulators I've played. How Fish is Made in a, in a factory, you, you fucking idiot. How Fish is Made is a short horror game published by Castraga in January of 2022. In How Fish is Made, you play as a sardine that has been swallowed by a giant mechanical fleshy creature inhabited by other sardines. At the beginning of the game, you meet a fish that tells you you gotta make a decision between going up or going down. It's the decision that everyone that enters needs to make. Throughout the game, we see a large variety of fish. Some are confused on what direction to choose, and some are very confident in their choice, and some are just trying to escape the situation, or just learn more about it. Once at the end of the game, you have the choice of either going down and becoming a sandwich to be eaten, or by going up and becoming a part of this giant fleshy mass for the rest of eternity. I feel like the message the game is trying to get across is the message of sticking to what you think is right and deciding things for yourself. 
Although, I, I could be wrong about that. The game and its two endings are pretty, pretty cryptic. Buzzkill. This entry refers to the three-part series of visual novel hybrid games created by Permafried Games on itch.io. I played the first game in this series and, um, I got, I got no, I got no words. I have absolutely no idea what the game is about. I think it's a, it's about a fly that runs a bar and uh, people come into the bar and they commit not alive on themselves and the, the fly guy is actually dreaming the whole time or something. I don't know, this, this, this game is, this game is ass. It's diarrhea doo doo. The White Chamber. The White Chamber is a science fiction adventure game created by Studio Trophies in 2005. In the White Chamber, you play as a girl that awakens in a coffin in a dark room with no memory of how she got there. After opening the room's windows, the girl realizes that she's in space. The gameplay revolves around the player going room to room solving puzzles to find out what happened to the crew of the space station. The game has some really solid puzzles and the writing and the, the way the game's twists are shown, they're very well done and are pretty surprising. It's a really great game and is definitely one of the better point and click horror games on the iceberg. Pen Pals. Pen Pals is a surreal adventure game made by Maroon Raccoon back in 2013. Pen Pals is a game where you have to find your mum while being accompanied by your abusive friend called Pal. In the start, you're really bored, so you go talk to your dad, but he's busy watching Static on the TV. You and your friend Pal go on an epic journey to pick your drunk mum up from a nightclub and bring her home. There was something pretty sad about this game. Probably both the story combined with the, the music it made me feel some things. The game's pretty short, only taking about 10 minutes, but despite its abrupt ending, it's still pretty good. All of our friends are dead. All of Our Friends Are Dead is a classic indie horror platformer made by Amon26 in 2014. The game is a really disturbing run and gun platformer that kind of feels like what it would be to play Metroid after you take 50 Benadryls. Trust me, I, 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 know, I know from experience. This game has some of the most unsettling imagery and music in any game on this iceberg so far. And um, that, that really says a lot. Like this game, this game really does not make any sense. Maybe I'm just dumb and I don't get the meaning behind a lot of the games on the iceberg, but this game, man, I, what the fuck is happening? They Speak From The Abyss. They Speak From The Abyss is a psychological horror dungeon crawler created by Nikki Cowper. The link on the iceberg led me to the game's itch.io page, but for some reason it's either been taken down or made private by the creator. Apparently the game is set to release on Steam pretty soon, so maybe that was the reason behind its disappearance. Also, there's a Kickstarter for the game that has made $26,000 from its original $20,000 goal, which is a pretty, pretty good sign. The Steam page does have a demo available, so I presume the original upload of the game on HIO was just the demo. After playing through the demo, uh, I gotta say this, this game is really cool. It's essentially a dungeon crawler that plays a lot like the Shin Megami Tensei games for the SNES. The music is just so off-putting, yet calming, and the characters you meet and the areas you explore are really disturbing. I, I, I can't wait to see the full game. I really hope it does well. Game Dog. Game Dog is a mobile game created by definitely the most prominent developer in the iceberg so far, the Catamites. Game Dog is a mini game collection based on the fictional handheld game console called the Game Dog. The console features dating sims, RPGs, sport games, all games that everyone is familiar with. Except something is wrong with these games. Some of the games in the collection are just playable enough that you can imagine them being a real game played by real people. Other games are, I guess you could say, surreal. Rat Chaos. Rat Chaos is a 2012 browser game created by the developer Winter Lake. The game is a choose your own adventure type experience where the game gives you a picture of your surroundings with a prompt 
and you get to pick between different options in order to get the best ending. The game is pretty cool for a browser game and I was surprised with the number of endings you can get. I honestly couldn't have asked for a better game. Rat Chaos is a masterpiece that should be remembered throughout the ages. They grew lungs and drowned. They Grew Lungs and Drowned is a first-person horror game made by Supposedly Spooky in May of 2022. It's a bit hard to understand what this game is about, but despite my confusion, it was still pretty interesting. In They Grew Lungs and Drowned, you explore this hospital in a desert place underwater, walking into a bunch of uh, quirky people. There's no real objective in the game, you just walk around talking to people and moving to the next area. The game is pretty spooky at times, and the art style is really cool, but honestly when compared to other walking simulators on this list, it's kinda just eh. Don't get me wrong, it's not a bad game or anything, it's just a bit forgettable. Saya no Uta Saya no Uta is a psychological horror game made by Nitroplus in 2003. Holy shit, this game is gory. After playing all the games on this iceberg, I thought I'd get used to all the gratuitous gore, but I guess I'm not. This game is a pretty standard Japanese visual novel game, where you play as a medical student whose life is ruined once he and his parents are involved in a car accident. With his five senses becoming distorted from the crash, he perceives his environment and people as hideous lumps of flesh and intestines. Spoken words sound like grunts and screeches. Regular meals taste and smell awful, and his sense of touch is also impaired. After going to the hospital following a fall into deep depression, he meets a pretty girl named Saya that turns out to be a horrific monster whose appearance drives people mad. With this premise, you can probably see why this game is so surreal and disturbing. The game has some pretty good writing, but overall the story is pretty unique and interesting. Definitely the most disturbing visual novel I've played so far. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that doesn't change. Cho Anarchy H.O. Anarchy is a 1995 shoot 'em up developed by NCS for the PC Engine CD. The game's title translates to Super Big Brother of Love. The game's plot takes place three years after the defeat of Emperor Bote, and the universe is now at peace. However, Bote's wife, Empress Body Conscious, has already planned her revenge. She revives Bote's builder army and kidnaps the hero Idaten, threatening the galaxy once again. Adon and Samson, with the help of Ben 10, take it upon themselves to save the galaxy and rescue their friend. With that description of the plot and the gameplay you're seeing on screen right now, you can probably tell why it's on the iceberg. Unfortunately, due to the game only being available for the PC engine, and the fact that emulation is illegal in Australia, and I don't have $500 to fork out on a PC engine, I'm not able to play the game. I don't know if I should feel relieved about that or not. Captain Blood series. This entry refers to the French game series from 1986, titled Captain Blood. The first game was released on the Atari ST and then the rest of the series eventually came to home computers. The series follows a 1980s game developer that while testing one of his new projects for the first time, gets warped inside the spaceship of the game he had designed. The story follows the game developer travelling around the universe, killing clones of himself that were made in a hyperspace accident. Despite the first game being a really solid title and having pretty unique gameplay for its time, the Captain Blood series never really gained the recognition it deserved and remains a pretty unknown cult classic. Roly Poly Games This entry on the list refers to the partially lost edutainment games created by Roly Poly Games in 1997. The two games that they made were Roly Poly's Nan Karobi Yalki and Roly Poly's World Tour. According to the Lost Media Wiki, the reason these games are only partially lost is because copies of both games are confirmed to exist but are very hard to come by. Whenever listing for the games become available on Japanese retail sites, they instantly sell and have not yet been made available to the general public. I know for a fact that there are some download links in places of the internet, but from what I can tell, the game is unplayable, even when run in a virtual machine. It's so sad we may never be able to experience Roly Poly, just 
Look how epic this looks. Mondo Medicals. Mondo Medicals is an indie puzzle game developed by Jonathan Soderstrom in 2007. In the opening of the game, a character greets the protagonist who is stated to have applied to participate in researching the cure for cancer. The gameplay involves the player completing puzzle solving challenges to get to the next room. Doing so often involves deliberately disobeying instructions and thinking outside of the box. The endings are also pretty cool but still very confusing. Apparently this is how you cure cancer, I guess. Damn, that's crazy. The Dream of Yourself. The Dream of Yourself is a spooky walking simulator created by Big ETI in 2021. In The Dream of Yourself, you adventure inside a huge tunnel that's kind of fleshy and gross and kind of looks like the inside of a person. The walls often flash yellow and red, but get brighter and brighter. The only real goal of the game is to keep moving forward and trying to find new passageways so as to not stop your journey. While the game doesn't really have combat or anything, you do eventually meet these giant eyes that move through the tunnels and will restart your game if you come into contact with them. It's a really cool game and after after playing it, it's pretty obvious that the game is much deeper than it looks. However, I'm definitely not smart enough to figure out what its meaning is. Architect Saga. This entry refers to the game series created by Yes Very Much. The two games in the series are these experimental walking simulators that are meant to give the player a taste of what it's like to live in the fictional Architect's city. While I didn't get to the second one, after playing the first game in the series, I was really surprised at how good it is. The world building and atmosphere just feels so detailed, and it's clear that these games were made with a lot of love. With plans for a third game, I definitely recommend checking out these games. They're not very well known and definitely deserve more attention. Endocopia. Endocopia is a really cool horror point and click adventure game developed by Andy Land and is set to release in the near future. While the game isn't out yet, there is a demo available on the itch.io page that I played. The game has quite a lot of followers with his Kickstarter raising over 50,000 big ones with a goal of only 20. After playing the demo, I gotta say, this game is phenomenal. I honestly think that when this game gets released, it's going to be the next big thing. Sort of like how Undertale was. I mean, it's got the music, the humor, the story, the art, the combat. This game is so good. This game is really unique and it combines my favorite aspects of all of my favorite genres. I can 100% say that this game is going to be massive when it comes out. And when it does, I'm totally here for it. If this kind of game looks good to you, go play the demo. And if it impresses you like it did to me, go support their Kickstarter. This game is going to be huge. Bam, that was the, the first half of the Surreal Game Iceberg. Super cool stuff. I'm sure, I'm sure you enjoyed it. Thanks for making it to the end. That's pretty cool if you're here. Uh, I doubt a lot of people are, but if if you are um cool you're a you're a, you're an epic gamer thank you if you did make it to the end then why, why haven't you subscribed yet you should already you would you, surely surely you'd be subscribed if you've watched this whole video that's that's the first half of the iceberg done it has taken me so long um I'm, I'm looking forward to the next half it's gonna be even weirder and wackier yeah that's uh that's the first half so uh yeah uh, i'll see you on the next one goodbye